Hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for this meeting. Um, so um, I think it's fair to say that the UK is is one of the leading places in the world for looking at energy efficiency of accelerators, um, all, along with CERN and ESS. Um, we have such a, a wide variety of different energy efficient aspects um, being developed in the UK. So we felt that it was um, a really good topic for a, a workshop um, to try and bring this all together in one place. Um, so um, as part of the IET, IMEC, e and IOP um, Particle Accelerator Engineering Network, we decided to make this one of our special workshops. The response has been absolutely fantastic. We have over 200 people registered for it. Uh, we've only got 66 people here at this moment in time, but I suspect that people will drop in and out throughout the day. It seems to happen in these Zoom meetings. But having around 200 people come to a, a, a topical specialist meeting is actually very high. I don't think we've had any meetings quite as high uh, as that since we started five or six years ago. Um, so it's really exciting and it just shows how much this resonates with people in the UK uh, as a concept. Um, the update for the European Strategy for Particle Physics recently had mentioned that in future, they expected all future particle accelerators to include a, um, a section in their CDRs and TDRs on energy efficiency. And energy efficiency would be a key requirement for any future accelerators. Um, Probably not entirely consistent with some of the large colliders I've seen, but um, certainly they're trying to, to move in that direction. Whether it be trying to use permanent magnets or high efficiency RF systems, or just being considered about when they use electricity, how they store it. Um, how do you, not just being efficient, but how do you manage the waste heat? Um, can you reuse it for, for heating? How do you buy your electricity? They're all aspects that need to be considered, uh, energy recovery. Um, so in this workshop today, I think we're going to cover all of those ideas um, and hopefully we'll all learn something. Uh, and even for future accelerators, whether we go to things like laser plasma, right now those lasers are really inefficient, but the, you know there's work going on in the UK and elsewhere to try and make more efficient high power lasers that can generate laser plasma accelerators with, with efficiency comparable to conventional accelerators. So I think this is going to be a, a big area moving forward. Um, so I won't speak for too long. I'll now hand you over to the chair of the first session, which is uh, Alan Litchford from ISA, who's going to chair this session. Uh, Alan? Thank you, Graham. Okay, so this is the first session. This will go on until uh, three then we'll have a short coffee break and then a session, second session after the coffee break. So we'll get straight on with it. I guess if uh, there's time, we'll have a few questions at the end of the talks and you can use the um, question button to submit those. So first talk today is on zero power tunable optics and it's Alex Bainbridge from the Diamond Light Source. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, just to clarify there, it's, uh, I'm not from Diamond, I'm from Darsby Laboratory. Uh, so my name's Alex, everyone. I'm uh, uh, a part of the Magnetics and Radiation Sources Group at Darsby, and I'm going to highlight a project that we've uh, been working on at Darsby, which I call the ZEPTO project, which stands for Zero Power Tunable Optics. So the introduction uh, for this came as a collaboration between CERN and Darsby Laboratory, and the idea was to save power and costs by switching from the traditional uh, resistive electromagnets to permanent magnet-based systems. Uh, and the reason for that is simply a case of power consumption. Uh, so Diamond, for instance, the UK's largest accelerator, draws about seven megawatts as a total facility. The LHC can draw up to 90 megawatts and the CERN campus as a whole can draw up to 200 megawatts, which is a very, very high power conduction, uh, consumption and it's a significant percentage of the uh, power consumption of the city of Geneva. 
And this is quite a hot topic at the moment, as Graham mentioned in his introduction. Uh, we've had quite a uh, quite a lot of interest uh, in this. Um, there's a Physics World article from 2019 where they called out labs for not doing enough to uh, look after their environmental footprint and keep up their uh, their green credentials. So our motivation behind this was the proposed Click Accelerator. And uh, Click is a very interesting design of machine. It involves uh, basically a three-stage system where you have a, a standard Linux accelerating a drive beam. That drive beam then gets decelerated uh, where it goes into RF cavities and then the power from the drive beam is harvested to accelerate the main beam that actually uh, collides. And this is an absolute beast of a machine. It requires a large number of magnets. Each of these turnaround loops, for example, involves 333 dipoles. Uh, 288 dipoles in the drive beam turnaround loops and a total of 42,000 quadrupoles in the drive beam alone. And if these are all resistive electromagnets, when you sum up their power consumption, you end up with some very big numbers. Uh, in particular, the whole Click project was estimated to draw around 580 megawatts, with 124 megawatts of that project projected for resistive electromagnets alone. And these numbers are just not sensible in uh, the modern world. Now, ideally, uh, when you build an accelerator these days, what you want is to just put up one of these and be done with it. But with these kind of power numbers, that's just not going to happen. Uh, and the surface of the ground above click is going to end up looking something like this if the accelerator actually ever gets built. And this is just unacceptable in uh, a day and age where we have to be really, really considerate of the environmental damage of our projects. So this is not a new idea to use permanent magnets in accelerators. There has been interest for a while, especially in storage rings, because permanent magnet systems are very useful where only small field strength adjustments are required. So permanent magnet dipoles for storage rings uh, have been uh, proposed uh, and in some cases actually implemented. So Spring 8, for instance, was one of the first uh, presented all the way back in 2014 to um, uh, have this kind of idea of a permanent magnet dipole, and they came up with this movable outer plate idea for tuning the field slightly. Uh, James Cittadini at Sirius uh, also came up with a couple of different ideas. Here's one of them. He also has a, a super bend dipole, and these uh, have a small amount of field tunability by moving uh, these plates at the back. Perhaps the most, uh, the, the biggest and most impressive uh, application so far is in the ESRF upgrade, uh, where this, uh, this design here was put forward uh, by Gail Lebeck and his colleagues for a longitudinal gradient dipole for the new ESRF lattice. Now, our challenge for Click, we were asked to look at uh, permanent magnet solutions for both the drive beams, uh, dipoles, and the drive beam quadrupoles. Now, you notice that of the examples I've given here, they're all dipoles for the simple reason that quadrupoles, normally you want some tunability in them, and that's very difficult. Uh, and that remains true here for click. The drive beam quadrupoles, uh, they needed potentially one uh, a tunability range from 100% all the way down to 10%. And for their dipoles, a tunability range from 100% down to 50%. So we were asked to look at some designs for this, and we came up with, with two quadrupole ideas. We came up with uh, this high strength tunable permanent magnet quadrupole, uh, which has a max gradient of 60.4 Tesla per meter, and then the, that can tune all the way down to 15 Tesla per meter. And this, despite not meeting the 100 to 10% tuning range, is actually usable for click because that tuning range is uh, an overall, but depending on the position within the drive beam, most magnets don't actually need that tuning range. Um, it's just a, uh, it, it's a, a step structure. So we did this as two separate types of magnets. And this uses uh, neodymium iron boron magnets, four permanent magnet blocks uh, of 18 by 100 by 230 millimeters. We also count with this lower strength gradient, uh, uh, lower, lower gradient uh, version, which has a maximum gradient of 43.4 Tesla per meter. And this one retreats the magnet blocks into a, an outer shell and which actually allows the, uh, a very high tuning range. It allows us to bring the gradient all the way down to 3.5 Tesla per meter. And these are fairly big magnets. You know, it's a realistic pole gap of 27.6 millimeters. 
good field quality, and again, reasonable size permanent magnet blocks. They're large, but they're not unmanageably large. Now, one problem that we found with these is that the magnetic center of these magnets tends to move. And the reason for that is that, well, you're moving uh, two blocks uh, or four blocks uh, a permanent magnet material. As they move, they may not move symmetrically. On top of that, the uh, design of the uh, yokes that they are moving uh, towards and away from uh, are not necessarily symmetric. There are other components like uh, guide rails, like the motors, and that can introduce uh, a little bit of movement in the magnetic center. Now, this is uh, potentially problematic, and it's one of the, the key points that we've sought to address recently. And one of the ways we're doing that is in our latest project, which is a technology demonstrator. So those magnets for Click have been built, they've been tested, but they're not actually going to be installed on a real machine unless Click gets built. In the meantime, uh, what we've done is we've designed a magnet which is currently under construction, which we're going to put on the uh, booster to synchrotron transfer line, uh, booster to storage ring, sorry, transfer line on diamond light source. And this gets around a couple of the issues that we've had before. In particular, it has two motors in its design, allowing us to move the blocks independently. So if we do find uh, that we have any movement in the magnetic center, we can compensate for that by moving just one of the magnet blocks. So that's one problem immediately solved, hopefully. The second change is that we use a modular magnet block system. So unlike the previous uh, Zepto quadrupoles, which had fairly large magnet blocks, this design uses a kind of tray structure with lots of much smaller blocks. Uh, these are much easier to build, to handle, to magnetize, uh, and cheaper overall. And then on top of that, if any of these blocks become damaged, it's a case of uh, just replacing a single block. And one thing that we found is that this also allows for the creation of modular kind of magnet families uh, of different strengths without new designs by strategically removing blocks from this structure and allowing the uh, steel uh, fixed poles and yokes to actually smear out the gaps in the field left by the missing blocks. This design can also be split clean in half, which is uh, a concern that we, people have had before about permanent magnets is how easy it is, is it to install them around an existing vacuum chamber? And the answer is you can do it with some very clever design. Uh, we have the ability with this first type to split it in half uh, and install it without removing the beam pipe. It's not easy, it requires a dedicated assembly frame because of the magnetic forces involved when you bring these components together but it's another problem which has now been solved. So the other challenge was to design a, uh, a dipole with a 100 down to 50% tuning range, which is the largest tuning range for a permanent magnet dipole uh, ever, as far as we're, we're aware. And this, we built a scaled down prototype from the one click actually needed, mostly for financial reasons. Uh, and this particular prototype was designed to have a max flux density of 1.1 Tesla, uh, a minimum of 0.46 Tesla, uh, a pole gap of 44 millimeters and a field homogeneity of 10 to the minus three over 30 millimeters. And here's an illustration of the, uh, the finished dipole and a short animation of just how, how it actually works with this single large magnet block, which slides in and out of two poles. When it's fully in, the field is looped through the steel poles and when it's fully out, only a small percentage of the field loops through them. Now, this was a particularly challenging project, not least because of the incredible magnetic forces involved. So just here's a, uh, an example of the predictions of the magnetic forces you have across this small gap between the magnet block and the steel poles up to 81 kilonewtons, which is an enormous force over eight tons effectively each side. And then on top of that, you have forces across this gap and forces in pulling the magnet block into the middle that you then have to fight against with your motor. So moving these magnet blocks is not a trivial thing to design. So the engineering for this ended up being quite complicated. We used a sliding uh, assembly using rails, a stepper motor and a gearbox. Uh, there are three support rods which hold the jaws of the magnet fixed and they can be independently adjusted. Uh, and there is a two millimeter air gap between the magnet block and the surface of the steel poles. The magnet block is huge in this. The dimensions are 500 by 400 by 200 millimeter, has four holes on the 400 mil axis for mounting. 
Uh, it's made from 80 individual magnet blocks, which are then uh, which are uh, magnetized individually and then all pushed together. So this is uh, just over a, a little bit of humorous illustration. This is the crater that actually arrived in with the magnetic shielding. Uh, and with the shielding removed, this is what happens when you put some spanners on top of the crate uh, to give you an idea of the strength of this magnet block. Uh, and then here it is looking a little bit like something from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, this uh, is, was quite a scary uh, block to handle, to be honest. So just as a, a word of caution for actually building a magnet like this for accelerators, it does require very careful consideration of how you're actually going to assemble it. Uh, and talking of assembly, here's what it, uh, how it, things looked when we're actually putting it together. Uh, we have a technician for scale on the left there, so you can actually get an idea of the, uh, the full size of the magnet. And here is it in its final position uh, in our magnet test lab. So we performed a full suite of measurements on it. Um, the, uh, they showed pretty good agreement with the simulations. We had uh, for the measured field and the simulated field were quite close. We had about a 1.8% offset uh, at, uh, at the fully in position. You can see the, we've actually plotted the percentage discrepancy there between the, uh, uh, the simulated and measured fields. Uh, we also found that the transverse field profile and longitudinal field profile were reasonable to the simulations. Uh, particularly here where we have the uh, measured flux density, which looks quite a lot lower than the simulated flux density, but when we apply that 1.8% offset to account for the lower field strength, uh, we find that it actually matches quite closely to the uh, original simulation. Uh, that offset can be, could be the result of many things. Um, in particular, there is still a reasonably large error margin that you get when you ask for a, uh, a magnet block to be delivered magnetized to a particular remnant field value, there is still quite a large error bar on that number. So some tunability is somewhat essential uh, unless you want to do sorting of magnet blocks and be prepared to throw away some of the ones that you actually get. So just a, a comparison between permanent and electromagnets from what we found. So permanent magnets have the disadvantage that they are difficult to tune. Whereas electromagnets, obviously you just change the current. Now we have demonstrated that it can be done. You can make tunable permanent magnet systems by moving these magnet blocks around. And that is one of the big challenges that's previously been seen as an obstacle to using permanent magnets in particle accelerators that's now been overcome. And the obvious advantage of using permanent magnets is that you have significantly less infrastructure around them. There are, you don't need big expensive power supplies uh, and large water cooling assemblies. Uh, you do need uh, still a control system for the motors and motors obviously, but that's significantly less infrastructure than the large power supplies and cooling systems that you often need for electromagnets. Uh, and that combines obviously with less long-term running costs, uh, both financial and environmental because of the lack of power draw. Um, one thing which is still a challenge uh, that we have not yet solved is that permanent magnets are very difficult to degauss, whereas electromagnets are easy-ish to degauss because of the fact that you can use a bipolar power supply and run a, uh, a reverse field through them, you can degauss them fairly easily. Now, all the perm tunable permanent magnets that we've built so far don't work like that. They are tunable, but the field is always going in the same direction, which means you can't degauss them. Now, there is a potential solution to this problem. Uh, ESRF have produced a design of a quadrupole which uses rotating uh, rods, a permanent magnet material, which are magnetized across the, the, the radial direction uh, and can turn using a belt drive. Now, in theory, you could reverse the field uh, with those. Whereas with the Zepto design, reversing the field actually requires physical removal of the magnet blocks uh, and reinstallation, which is not a quick or easy procedure. Uh, permanent magnet blocks are also easier to damage. Um, permanent magnets are particularly rare earth magnets, physically fragile. And on top of that, they may be susceptible to demagnetization from uh, excessive heat loads or radiation bombardment. But they have the advantage that you can make them modular. This goes back to the, uh, this tray design of small magnet blocks. If you find that a particular magnet block has become damaged or shatters or gets demagnetized, you could potentially replace just that one individual block. 
uh, which is a, a very easy and cheap repair. Whereas with an electromagnet, they're hard to damage, but if you do manage to damage them, you've basically got to replace the entire magnet. And finally, permanent magnets are initially more expensive to buy than electromagnets, but that's somewhat offset by the fact that you don't need to buy power supplies and chillers to go with them. If you're building an accelerator underground, you also don't, don't need to worry too much about uh, extracting the heat from the tunnel. Uh, whereas electromagnets, they may be initially cheaper, but then you have the long-term usage costs. So what about environmental comparisons between the two? Well, the short answer is that there's actually no simple answer as to whether permanent magnets are more or less environmentally damaging than electromagnets. Uh, and the reason for that is that rare earth material mining is highly polluting. Um, if you're using samarium cobalt or neodymium iron boron magnets, uh, they both use rare earth materials and rare earth material mines are horrible affairs that involve typically involve strip mining large amounts of land, uh, polluting waterways and emitting large amounts of CO2 in the mining uh, procedure. So in that case, permanent magnets are at somewhat of a disadvantage. However, not needing power, uh, does that then offset the environmental cost compared to electromagnets? Uh, and the answer is, well, we did, a, or, or Ben Shepard did an analysis on this a little while back, and he found that typically after about a year of use, uh, you're in a, an environmental net benefit from using permanent magnets. However, I would contest that there is also the answer is that it depends on where your accelerator is. Uh, for example, if you build your particle accelerator in Iceland, uh, I'm not sure why you, why, why you would, but if you did build it in Iceland, you would find that because uh, that country, for instance, uses entirely geothermal power, there would be no environmental benefit to using permanent magnets because all power generation is, is completely clean. However, if you built your accelerator in Australia, which is mostly powered uh, still by uh, very dirty coal power plants, using tunable permanent magnets could be uh, a very, very quick saving in environmental costs. They could pay for themselves in terms of CO2 emissions very, very quickly uh, from not having to draw power. Uh, and so on that note, I'd like to end the talk there and thank you all for coming and listening. Okay, thank you, Alex. Very interesting. Um, I see we do still have a, a few minutes. So there's uh, one question that's come in. I'll read it out. <coughs> Excuse me. This is from uh, Chris Riley. He asks, with the modular design magnets, how do you compensate for small variations in the strength of each magnet block? And do you use a sorting algorithm? So there's two answers to this. Um, the first answer, do, do, do we use a sorting algorithm? Yes, we certainly can. Uh, we can do it so that we order more blocks than we actually need and then sort through to find those that are uh, closely, closely matched in strength to what we need. And we can also offset. So with our magnet uh, tray design, uh, we have two blocks each side of a central spine. So we compare a block that's over strength with a block that's under strength to uh, save blocks there and make a, a, a macro block that's of the right strength. The second thing is that with our current designs, with the Zepto designs, what we have is uh, the magnet blocks are not directly next to the beam like they are with an undulator, for instance. They go through the field, uh, goes from the blocks through a set of fixed steel poles uh, before it reaches the beam. And in passing through those steel poles, small variations tend to smear out, uh, leading to, um, to uh, the beam feeling the kind of average of all the blocks rather than uh, individual blocks. So if we have one block that's under strength, um, by the time the field has passed through several centimeters of steel, uh, the field from the blocks around it is basically mixed in with it and you, the, it all averages out. Okay. Another question just come in, an anonymous attendee. Is the field quality the same for all field strengths for a given magnet? Yes and no. Um, it's, uh, so with the Zepto magnets, when you tune the field, um, the field quality does change slightly. However, uh, they are designed so that the field quality at all uh, points on the tuning range is within the, uh, the field quality requirements of click. So the answer is that yes, the field quality does change as you change the magnet, but by a small enough amount that it remains within tolerances of, of every accelerator that we've designed for so far. 
Okay, thanks. So we'll have one final question. We've got about a minute. It's from Ian Bates. In in the design, what sort of issue did you have with the material selection in the surrounding components? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So um, one of the issues, obviously, with the Zepto design is that when you're moving magnet blocks uh, and you move them away from the center, if you have asymmetries in your, uh, say, outer yoke for the, the low strength prototype, um, then you can move the magnetic center. And what you need to do is you need to minimize those asymmetries. So you need to make sure that if you have um, uh, erroneous material that's needed mechanically on the top of the magnet, for instance, you may need to, uh, or you will need to know what the magnetic properties of that material are, and you may then need to compensate by putting uh, a similar amount of that material, which is uh, mechanically unnecessary on the bottom, but is there to help even out the magnetic field. Now, we're hoping that the, um, that the dual motor design of the uh, diamond prototype will actually solve that problem because then we can uh, develop a lookup table during measurements to just offset the magnet blocks to compensate for any uh, any stray magnetic material in the uh, in the surrounding mechanical components. Okay, thank you. Well, that's excellent. So thanks again. Very interesting talk. We'll move on now to our second talk, which is on high efficiency klystron development by uh, Jinji Kai from Lancaster University. Uh, is that the host? <sighs> Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my topic today is about the high efficiency classroom study in some. Share my screen first. Uh, 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 good afternoon, everyone. So the, the topic is about the efficiency frontiers of high, high power classrooms, high power, high efficiency classrooms. Uh, 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 firstly, I want to present that we, we have two existing commercial prototypes for, uh, for click uh, one gigahertz, 20 megawatt uh, classrooms. So they are already built and tested in industry. So they're both operated around one gigahertz uh, with uh, 20 megawatt output, output power level. And uh, the, the, the issue is that the, 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 the classroom is very big because the frequency is one gigahertz and with uh, high power, we need high voltage. So meaning that the, the whole classroom is, uh, is like three meters long and inside it, the, the beam width interaction circuit is about 1.6 millimeters. Also, we are not satisfied with the efficiency so much because by looking at the uh, empirical uh, efficiency versus beam prevents curve, we believe that we can achieve 18% efficiency if we do uh, a, renew, a renew design. So why we need to upgrade the efficiency? So this, uh, this is very simple. In large accelerator projects such as FCC and CLIC, uh, the, the, the IF power level is huge. So I, I do some calculations in this table. So if I can upgrade the efficiency of the classroom from 17% to 85%, I can save 150 million Swiss francs in 10 years. And also because with reduced, because with the with the increased uh, increased efficiency uh, with the with the same goal output power, so I can use uh, less uh, less uh, gun voltage. So meaning that the, the stored energy in the modulator is reduced. So the installation cost is also reduced. Also I can use NAS uh, cancel current for classrooms. So meaning that the, the, the classroom uh, lifetime could be prolonged. And also I can reduce the environmental impact because the, the energy in the spent bin is also reduced. So this is a lot of benefits if we can increase the efficiency of the of, of all kind of the classrooms, but for this kind of classrooms, this is another issue. So I, I, I've just I've just mentioned that for the one gigahertz uh, um, high power classrooms, uh, the the total length of the tube is quite long. So we, we have to uh, we 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 want we want to uh, develop new uh, technologies uh, for classrooms to improve the efficiency while reducing the, the total length to make it more compact. So this, there, are, there are two sketches here. So you see, this is a, a traditional uh, classroom design. So you use a, you use a, a DC electric gun to accelerate the, the, the beam here. So 
for 100 something kilovolt. And then the electron beam, the DC electron beam is passing through all these IF cavities to experience the, the, the bunch, uh, the, the, the current modulation and the bunching process uh, before it's entering the output, output gap here. And in the output cavity, the, the energy, is, the power extracted from the electron beam, then the, the, the spin beam is connected in the connectors. So the issue is that because in this, most, most of the part of the circuit is, uh, is from input cavity to output cavity. So with a very high, uh, with very high voltage of electron beam, so this circuit then is naturally very long. So considering we use, uh, we, are, we, are, we are considering the low uh, frequency uh, classrooms. So this will be uh, as long as one or two or three meters. Um, so the, the issue is that the, the, the issue is that if we can reduce the voltage of the classroom in most of the in most of the this, the, this circuit, we might uh, reduce uh, the total length of the classroom. So this is why we uh, put forward the two stage concept in the classroom design. For example, in the first stage, we don't use 100. 15 kilowatt, we use maybe 20 or 13 kilowatt. Uh, then this kind of the circuit length is, uh, is, is reduced by, uh, by several times. And uh, before the, the, the power extracted from the, from the out of the cavity, we use the post acceleration gap here to accelerate the beam. Then, the, then here, the beam with a very, uh, very good quality bunch and also the, also the designed uh, voltage level. So this, uh, so in all the cavity, the power could be extracted from, uh, from this gap. But for the most of the part of the circuit, it's running the low voltage. So the, the whole lens could be shrinked. And then later on, we also find that in the post acceleration gap, the, the uh, voltage, no, the, the energy spread, the absolute energy spread will not, will, will be uh, kept unchanged. So while the whole voltage level is increased, is boosted by several times, meaning that the relative energy spread will be uh, will be much lower than the traditional one. So this is an advantage to increase uh, the the efficiency of the whole classroom. So there are so uh, so because we we according to this rough analysis, we found that there are so many benefits of this classroom. So we we put this into work and to try whether this concept will. Uh, will, will, will work through or not. So first we design the cavities. Uh, for example, for the, for, the, for, the, for the same cluster I proposed in, the, in, the, in my uh, second uh, slide, so the, the, the commercial one. So I use the same uh, specifics, one gigahertz, 20 megawatt output, output power. So we use a, a multi-beam cluster design. So this, this, is a very, uh, this is a very conventional. So this is a 20 beam nits design uh, for the coaxial cavities. And for the output cavity, we use some techniques uh, to make sure the field symmetry for each beam nits is, uh, is, uh, is, is not at worst. Because if we use, uh, we don't use these tiny structures, uh, the field will be distorted in this, in this region. So we have some technologies to develop the, the cavities. So this is uh, very straightforward. So the um, most interesting part is that because it's two stage clusters, meaning that in the first stage where the input power uh, locates the the uh, the potential on, on this body is not is not grounded, meaning that we if we feed through the IF power from outside to these clusters, we need to use some uh, high voltage isolated IF feed through. So we use some chuck chuck structures here to uh, to uh, make a thick uh, metonic wall here to for, to form a cavity in this region in the around the operating frequency. So the IF, so IF power could be fit through through this, uh, this region uh, while these two parts are physically separated. So this, uh, we can use some ceramics to isolate it the high voltage, to insulate it the high voltage. So this is a, uh, this is a very clever design. Um, so with this, uh, with this uh, cavity uh, geometry design, so we can do some beam wave interaction analysis. Uh, we produce, uh, we previously developed it the CLI code, so which is for the large singular class transformation. Now we uh, implemented the DC module into this code uh, uh, to, to facilitate the, the, 
two-stage cholesterol analysis. I think there's no code available except the, the commercial P code could do such analysis because this, uh, this kind of analysis done in the clinic is quite accurate and also very fast. Um, so we do a lot of optimizations based on the clinic. And uh, we found that uh, in the optimi op optimized case, uh, the the uh, the radio stratification of the bean. So this for this this is uh, for different layers uh, modulation tapes. So they could be um, like very similar around the output amp, meaning that the physically, if we see the bean, it's not like the it's like not, not like the comb. It's like the uh, a cylindrical shape, meaning that for different layers, uh, the functionance is quite similar. So this is uh, very good for the power extraction in the output gamp. So we can increase, uh, uh, we can we can enhance the efficiency performance if we use uh, use this two stage uh, technologies. We also do some analysis by uh, choosing the the uh, voltage split between the first uh, stage and the second stage. So these are some studies for each point we do, each point is optimized the results. So uh, finally we choose this value because, uh, because it's like the com compromise between the efficiency and the turbulence. So it's uh, around 25 kilowatt for the first stage. So in, in the client simulation, we can achieve 85% efficiency uh, for this design. Uh, another very interesting aspect of this study is that uh, because we use post acceleration DC gamp to accelerate the punched beam before the output gamp, so there's a risk of IF field linking, IF field linking this DC gamp here because this not enclosed circuit here. So when the punched beam passing through this gamp, uh, if you if you do nothing, the IF field will link into the oil tank. So this power level is around. Um, it's around 1.8 kilowatts. And this is not acceptable because uh, there's a risk of boiling the oil, uh, oil tank. Uh, so we need to do something to, um, to uh, suppress the IF uh, linkage. So we uh, designed some uh, tiny structures here. So it's like the choked, uh, choked structures. So it will form the so for the first, for the, for the harmonic harmonics and the second harmonics, uh, it will uh, generate some uh, electric boundary here. So meaning that when the uh, electron beam, which operated around one gigahertz passing through this gamp, this, uh, this frequency, the, the, that field in this frequency will not link into this, uh, linking us uh, through this gamp, but will be reflected. So this is, uh, it's, it's like artificial cavities here. So we can uh, compare these two pictures. So without this choke mode, the field will be linking to the outside world. So it's, uh, this is open boundary. So with these uh, structures, the field will be constrained in this region. So we can reduce uh, the IF, uh, IF field linkage uh, to almost uh, 0.4 watt. So even with the uh, tolerance analysis, the, the, the radiated power will not exceed five watts in average. So this is a, a quite this is a quite uh, practical design. So if we really want to build this tube, um, I do some uh, sophisticated uh, 3D peak simulation for these structures. Uh, so this is a, this is a structures in the first stage. Uh, in the first stage, uh, the electron beam is passing through this, these cavities, and then it experiences, uh, out the, cap uh, experiences uh, the post accelerating DC gamp here, and then the power is extracted in the output gamp. So we saw this, this, these are all uh, physical and the practical cavity design. So it's uh, all the features are here. So the peak simulation shows that with a, a practical magnetic field, we can achieve about uh, 82% uh, efficiency in the 3D peak simulation. So we, do, we, 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 uh, did, uh, we didn't do the further optimization in this tube because uh, now it's not considering for prototyping, but by comparing these results and the, the clinic results, the, the difference is, uh, is, uh, is not that uh, huge. So it's about 3%. So most of the error is coming from this region. Because in this region, the client can't can model very well without this uh, space charge impact. But still, the results are quite similar. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we can achieve um, one or two percent more if we do further optimizations. So this is a, a peak simulation result for two-stage design. 
And also we do some engineering uh, sketch, sketches for this uh, two-stage crystals. So by putting some uh, ceramics here and with uh, oil tank surrounding this uh, uh, crystal body, we think this crystal is uh, feasible. So, uh, and the total lens is quite shrinked comparing with the original, uh, original uh, uh, commotion design. So it's, uh, you can see that here it's reduced almost by uh, 70 and 18% of the total lens. So with a little bit uh, boosted efficiency, so it's, uh, it's around 10%. Now also another benefit of this uh, uh, design is that uh, if we want to use lower uh, beam power by reducing the, the gun voltage uh, for the, uh, for the uh, normal one stage cholesterols, the, the efficiency will be dropped dramatically. And for the two stage cholesterols, uh, so it will not, so it will just drop mildly. So we can see that. So this is another uh, advantage of this uh, of this new technology. Um, uh, um, apart from this uh, uh, one gigahertz uh, uh, multi beam for a click project, so we can also use our parametric uh, scaling procedure to scale this uh, two stage castron to uh, to other. Uh, to other uh, high efficiency two stage cholesterols. For example, if we take the um, specifics from the, uh, the 1.3 gigahertz IOC cholesterol, so we can also do the two stage technologies on that cholesterol. So it's something, the, 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 so the design results is something like this. So we can also reach 85% efficiency. So comparing with the original design of the 65% efficiency. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's a good upgrade as we, we think. So I, I made a short summary of the uh, two-stage Martin uh, fam, uh, uh design. So the first is that uh, using the two-stage Martin Calestrons, because we frozen the, the uh, energy variation uh, in the first stage by using post-accelerating process, so, and also we can, uh, so we can also improve the radio stratification of the bunch in different radio layers, meaning that we can achieve a little bit higher efficiency than the conventional design. Uh, we can apply this uh, technology to other projects which using the ultra high frequency or L band, uh, L -band uh, clustrons uh, to, uh, to further enhance the efficiency. And also uh, because uh, we use two stage cholesterols in the first stage of the voltage is low. So the total uh, length of the, the cholesterols could be, uh, could be shrinked uh, as, uh, as, 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 uh, as natural as almost two, two times. So meaning that this cholesterol could be a very compact uh, while the efficiency is also boosted. So we can put this uh, into, the, into the space limited on the ground tunnel environment. So this is um, for the two stage mapping clusters. And there are also some other projects is, uh, is also uh, went smoothly. So the, one, of the, uh, so one of the example is the uh, X-band cluster. So because this is a high frequency, so the, the whole circuit is naturally short. So we don't need to consider the complicated two-stage scheme. Uh, we, use, uh, we can use uh, some harmonics, like the second harmonics to shrink the tube. For, the, for this one, we did a lot of studies. Finally, we just come up with, uh, with the feminines as the original design. So the original design is from CPI. You can see the, this, uh, these parameters here. So I didn't change the circuit lens uh, uh, by doing some optimization to increase the efficiency. So finally, the circuit lens is the same. So meaning that we can do the retrofit work. We just need to replace the, the, the F circuit here to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the updated one. So to boost the output power. So you can see that uh, the range of the power uh, is about this level. So now we can get the, almost the 16 megawatt and the efficiency is almost doubled. So it's uh, from 16, six to 16, from 36 to 69. So this is uh, uh, in this design. So we use some multi serial output carpenters, uh, multi serial output cavities here. You can see that. So in, in CLIC, we implemented the coupling model theory uh, in this uh, in these uh, structures. Uh, so meaning that in, in this analysis, we did assume that this is a one mode uh, one mode operation or the traveling mode operation. 
So this is a no. So we just mixed all this mode by putting the coupling coefficient between each fails. Uh, and and the, all, the, all this uh, uh, efficiency optimization is uh, done by the computer algorithm automatically. So finally, we can reach the almost the 17% efficiency uh, with this design. Uh, by looking into this mode, uh, mode pattern, uh, we finally found that this is not a single mode. It's not a single standing wave mode or it's not a simply traveling, traveling with mode. So it's, a, it's some kind of the mixture. So it's a, this is a very uh, complicated design, but with this, uh, with this uh, tool, so we can, uh, with this simulation tool, so we can finally achieve the 70% efficiency, which is benchmarked by the, by the peak simulation. Uh, also very, uh, also another aspect for the classroom design is about the optics design. So the optics design meaning that you have to uh, generate the electron beam, uh, confine it into the confine it inside the the F circuit, then you connect it to the beam in the connectors. So this is about the beam optics design. So we developed some two D tools uh, to do such a, a simulation, and we found that because it's a retrofit design, so most of the most of the part of the optics, including the uh, the the solenoid magnets. The, the, the gun geometry and the, this part and the circuit part could be kept as unchanged uh, compared with the original design. But because we use different uh, R circuit, meaning that the, the energy, the power level of the spin beam will be changed. So the, uh, the connector uh, should be uh, modified a little bit. So we do some studies. And in, the, in this 2D code, I implemented some uh, module to include it, the uh, to include it, the I've I've uh, failed dictionaryation. So use the uh, use the uh, energy spread uh, techniques to uh, imitate this process. So we can use this tool to analyze uh, the 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 model for the DC and for the for, for the F off and F on. So we can see that with the modifications of the connector uh, connector surface. Uh, we can achieve the we can achieve our goal. So our goal is to make sure that the 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 current the power density uh, participated in the connector service is below 500 watts per square centimeters. So this goal is achieved by properly adjusting the the connector shape. Uh, yes. So this is about the 50 megawatt capacitance. So the last two slides, I don't want to go into deeply. So because all, all this work is based on, uh, on our codes developed in some uh, to do the class transformation, to do the optics simulation. So if you are interested, so I have put a lot of references here. So you may, uh, you may look, look into it. And if you are interested to use this code, you can contact with, uh, with me and my supervisor so for, the, for the link. So this is about the CLIC, the beam wave interaction module. And this is about the C-GUN. So this is a 2D electron beam tracking module. So this is some uh, benchmark results for, about the 2D gun code. Also, this uh, was very interesting. This is uh, another, uh, uh, another project where we are we're also doing some. So for the, for the, uh, for the linearizer of the, of the uh, compact light project. So this is, uh, but, but uh, here I don't want to go, go into it. So this is a benchmark of this code. So I benchmarked the, the 2D code with another 2D code SIG and 3D code SSD. So we found that the, the results are quite consistent and the agreement is uh, quite good. Uh, yes, I think that's, a, that's the end of the story. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jinji. It's very interesting work going on there. So we'll have one very quick question as, as ones came in from Becky Sevier. She asks, um, when you say 85% efficiency, is that the maximum efficiency? Or is that, is that the efficiency of operation, i.e. on the power curve for a klystron, you usually have to back off to get phase control, but then that reduces the efficiency? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, let me answer your question. So first, uh, the 85% efficiency is the saturated efficiency, meaning that you have to put every parameter in its op optimal uh, status. So in the, in the uh, real uh, 
we will operate the cholesterols because you want to uh, control. So you, you want to control the phase. So you want to adjust the input power a little bit in this uh, uh, little bit. So meaning that you have to use less input power rather than saturated input power. So with reduced input power, of course, uh, of course the power level will be reduced. And also the efficiency will be uh, reduced a little bit because because you, you, you know that the cholesterol is, uh, is like the, you know that the, this uh, power transfer curve of the cholesterol. So in the saturation level, so this is a little of the bend of this curve. So when you, in, when you reduce the input power to the linear region, uh, so in, in, in that case, uh, in, in that case, you will lose some efficiency. But, um, but, most of the, but in most of the region, so if you don't use very low input power, uh, you, you still can get 18% uh, efficiency or 17% some kind of efficiency. So you can imagine if you don't put input power in it, you will get nothing from this cholesterol. So the efficiency will be zero. So, the, the, so in, the, in, the, in the practical situation, it determines how much input power you will use. So yes. if you use input power close to a saturation level, so you can get 85% efficiency. But if you don't use the saturated, saturated point, you reduce input power to try to make the phase control. So meaning that you have to lose some efficiency. I think this is a, this is a very natural and it depends on how you operate the, the, the system. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks again for an interesting talk. We'll thank move you. straight on. And our next talk is on future high efficiency lasers for laser plasma accelerators. And the speaker is Laura Corner from Liverpool University. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about how we make high efficiency lasers for future particle accelerators. And as part of that, I'm going to describe briefly um, laser weight field acceleration, why we're using lasers as power sources for um, particle acceleration. Um, looking at the efficiency of these types of accelerators, and what sorts of laser drivers we can have and work that's being done on how to make those more efficient. So um, why are we interested in laser weight field, plasma weight field accelerators? Um, obviously particle accelerators um, have, have huge uses across all aspects of science medicine. And the current accelerating gradients are set by a breakdown in, in the conventional machines. And that, of course, limits the size and the cost of machine if you want to reach um, a particular energy to these large uh, macroscopic, you know, town size, facility size accelerators. Laser weight field acceleration is of interest because you can generate very high accelerating gradients. And that's what drives a lot of the research into this area, the possibility that we could change the size and, and cost of, of um, accelerating machines. So laser weight field acceleration works by focusing um, a high power intense laser into a neutral gas. The gas then becomes ionized, giving you a population of free electrons and ions. And the electrons are expelled away from the region of high intensity of the laser. And they form a wake field, an oscillating wake field behind, behind the laser pulse in the plasma. Now, the electric fields that can be sustained in this plasma can be very, very high indeed, sort of uh, possibly a thousand times higher than you can get in conventional accelerators. And some of the electrons in the plasma can be trapped in these accelerating weight fields and accelerated to extremely high energies in very short distances. And there are amazing numbers for um, this acceleration that have been produced in research laboratories so far up to 8 GV in 20 centimeters, just over 3 GV in 14 millimeters. And you can see from these very high accelerating gradients that there's a huge potential here to reduce the size and cost of accelerators if we could use this accelerating technology. So there's obviously a lot I could say about this in more detail, but we're looking at the efficiency of these machines. So let's have a, a look at how you would break down the efficiency of a laser-driven plasma accelerator. So the first thing is our driver, if you like, the equivalent of a klystron is the laser itself. So there's going to be an efficiency of the laser. If you plug it into the wall, how much optical laser energy do you get out for a given electrical input? 
There's the efficiency of how we transfer this laser power then to the plasma. We're using the energy of the laser to um, drive an oscillation in the, in the free plasma electrons. How efficiently is that done? And then we're thinking about how the energy of the plasma, this energy stored in the oscillation of the, of the plasma, how is that transferred to the beam itself? What's the energy that we get out in terms of the accelerated electrons at the end of this process? So looking at a few of these things, um, these numbers aren't super precise. Some of them are simulation. These things are difficult to measure, but we have a, a good understanding of the physics involved in these and good simulations and some measurements. And there's estimates of around 50% of the energy that can be tra transferred from the laser to the plasma. And then estimates of the transfer of the energy to the electron beam, that's a, a quite a complex thing, depending on, on um, the charge you have in your bunches, how they're shaped, but sort of 20 to 40% are reasonable estimates. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, is not to nail down a specific number for these parts, but to say, show that these, these efficiencies are in the, the tens of percent. So what's, what does this look like for the laser efficiency itself? We're looking at laser drivers for um, laser weight field experiments. One of the most famous is the Bella laser at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. They're one of the uh, leading laboratories for investigating laser plasma weight field acceleration. They have a, a, a laser which is, has a petawatt peak power. These are the kind of system we're talking about, so huge peak powers, and this operates at one hertz. And even that isn't the limit of the scale to what we can achieve with these laser systems. So um, the commercial company Tales have produced 10 petawatt uh, laser pulses for the ELI facilities in Europe. So peak power, these lasers are amazing, but what can we say about their electrical efficiency? Mm. It's not great so the bella laser i was just discussing it's uh, about a petter it's about a petawatt peak power and it achieves that by putting out 40 joules in um 40 femtoseconds but it only does one of these shots a second so that the average power output of the bella laser is 40 watts now the electricity draw for that laser system is 130 kilowatts that is 0.03 percent so if we go back to my previous slide, looking at the efficiency overall of a laser weight field plasma accelerator, we can see that the problem is in the laser, right? You could fiddle around with these other numbers by a few percent, but if you really want to make a difference to the, this being um, an, an efficient uh, accelerator, then clearly where you want to work is the laser. That's the major problem. If you could get this up by an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, you would make a huge difference to the overall electrical efficiency, therefore the cost, therefore the environmental impact of the laser based on this technology. So to understand a little bit why these numbers can be so low, um, we have to do a little bit of laser physics. So I'm gonna talk about titanium sapphire, which is the laser that's most commonly used for high power um, uh, laser weight field accelerator experiments. And this is just um, an energy level diagram of a laser. The important things that you need to know about here are the way that we get energy into a laser system is by applying is by supplying energy in the way in the form of pump photons, which raise population in your laser from a low level to a high level of excitation. And some other things happen, but eventually you get out a photon on the laser transition. And for titanium sapphire, the um, the, the pump band, how we get photons into our system is in the green in the visible wavelengths and the actual laser transition for titanium sapphire is around 800 nanometers, which is in the near infrared. And this is an example of what's called the quantum defect in lasers. That is the difference between the pump photon energy supply and the laser photon energy. And that's a really fundamental limit to the efficiency that you could get out of any laser system. So that what you want in a laser medium is to have a small quantum defect because then you have less energy left behind in the system. So we've got a number of problems here. One is that um, this excess energy is often left in the laser. So not only are you inefficiently supplying energy to your laser because your pump photon energy is not um, fully converted into laser uh, photon energy, 
You've also got an additional problem whereby your laser heats up and therefore you have to have a whole ton of extra power to put into your system to cool it down. And cooling of lasers is something that's often forgotten in um, an analysis of their efficiency, but is actually one of the very important things that determine how much power they draw. The other thing then is, is how do we get this energy, these pump photons into our laser in the first place? Well, in the case of titanium sapphire, we do it with another laser. Uh, it's usually um, a, a, a neodymium YAG laser, which is a, a different type of laser system. Again, we've got this issue where we supply pump photons and we get light out. Now, neodymium YAG lasers have traditionally been pumped by flash lamps. So with a broad white um, spectrum, so this is a, a typical sort of flash lamp spectrum. And here over roughly the same wavelength range, you see the absorption spectrum of neodymium YAG. And this illustrates another major problem of laser systems that uh, flash lamp pumping has been used quite often for a, a wide range of laser systems but is inherently inefficient. As you can see from the overlap of these two spectra, we're putting in a whole number of photons from the flash lamp, which aren't gonna get absorbed by our laser medium usefully at all. So now we're talking about how do we pump our pump laser. It can be done by flash lamp, which is broadband and inefficient, or you can get targeted laser diodes, which are another sort of laser, but at least electrically pumped, which are much more narrow band. So you can target a specific absorption wavelength in your laser and, and have most of your pump photons absorbed there. Another problem for titanium sapphire is that you might see that the emission wavelength of this neodymium lag laser is also in the near infrared. Whereas I said on the previous slide that we need to pump in the green for titanium sapphire. So there's another conversion step we have to do to pump the laser, the TISAF laser, which is going to be our, our ultra fast petawatt laser system that, that runs our laser accelerator, is we need to take the output of this pump laser and convert it uh, to a different, a different color. And that's done by a process called nonlinear uh, frequency conversion, which in and of itself might only be 50% efficient. So I've run quite quickly through some laser physics there, but what I've hoped that you've taken from this is that this number about the wall plug efficiency for our drive laser is bad because we're dependent on so many other processes. So if we just look at the chain by which we get to our titanium sapphire drive laser, the energy that we're putting into our accelerator, we have an electricity source. We use that to drive a flash lamp or some laser diodes. Those then pump a neodymium YAG laser, which will have its own quantum defect and, and own issues about absorption efficiency. Then we have to take the output of that laser. We have to do a non-linear frequency conversion process to get it to be the correct color to pump the titanium sapphire laser, which again has its own quantum defect. And then we have to think about cooling all of these things as well. So I think you can see from that, there are a number Number of places where you can um, lose energy and, and a part of the reason why some of these lasers are so inefficient there are these complex chains about how we supply energy to our final laser output. So if we want to make lasers better, and that's clear, that's where the win would be for us in making a more efficient plasma accelerator, what can we do? So we can make what we have better, we can make the systems that we have more efficient, um, take less cooling. We can look at new laser media. So I've described here a very specific laser type, titanium sapphire, which is, is sort of like the, the market leader in, in ultra short laser, lasers at the moment. But does it have to be? Can we find a different laser medium which has better physical characteristics that are, would allow us to use it more efficiently? Can we reuse the laser? Uh, energy or the energy stored in the plasma so that even if our laser efficiency can't be improved too much, can we use it more efficiently in the acceleration process? And finally, are there current more efficient lasers that we could look at using as drivers instead of these uh, inefficient solid state systems? So I can't talk about all of these today. I don't have enough time. That's, that's many hours worth of seminar. So I'm going to provide a couple of examples um, for you to have a look at if you're interested. So making what we have better is something that many large labs are concentrating on at the moment. And a great example of this is the Dipole project um, at, at the Rutherford Labs. 
um, looking at making high power and high efficiency pump lasers so that you could move away from that whole neodymium YAG, sort of cut out the first three or so sections of the chain I had on a previous slide. Uh, and they've been hugely successful in, in developing this. Um, new laser media, uh, there's a really interesting project going at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs on what they call their BAT laser, big aperture thulium laser, um, where they're looking at uh, laser media where the, 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 do the active iron is thulium, and that can be directly pumped by diodes very efficiently and has a low quantum defect, and they're doing some great work on whether that would be a suitable drive for uh, laser weight field accelerators. Reusing the laser or the plasma energy well, if we have 50% of our laser left over at the end of the acceleration process, can we think of a way of perhaps collecting that energy, reflecting it back and using it again? Can we think about extracting the energy left in the plasma again, if you've only got 50% or so of the energy from your plasma going into your accelerated beams? Can we extract that somehow? And there are um, ways of looking at that. Uh, in particular, you can use a second laser pulse, which is timed out of resonance with the plasma oscillation that your first drive laser has excited. And that, and that laser pulse can extract energy from the plasma, which can then be recycled. And this is a link to, I believe, the first paper that actually demonstrated that could be done. And then finally, um, can we use current lasers better? And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, one of the things that I think is the most promising uh, research areas uh, for, for, this, for this problem, which is about using fiber lasers and then combining those. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this session. So what's a fiber laser? Uh, an optical fiber laser is just an optical waveguide and we're all familiar with the idea of passive optical fibers in telecommunications. Light is guided over long distances in, in an optical core. And to turn an optical fiber into an optical fiber laser, all we do is dope the core with lasing irons. Typically these systems run at in the, the near infrared, um, around about one micron, and they can sustain very high average powers with excellent laser quality. And one of the reasons that they can sustain these high average powers is that they have a very good form factor for cooling. So an optical fiber, if you think about what that looks like, it has a very high surface area to volume ratio. So there's lots of surface area to get rid of heat. A number of optical fibers work with no external, uh, no external cooling at all. And this ability to reduce your cooling uh, requirements is also something which is a strong driver of increasing efficiency in a laser system. But to actually think about the efficiency of these, of these laser systems, so these can be driven by uh, laser diodes, which are themselves highly efficient. You can get semiconductor laser diodes commercially, which are 50% wall plug efficient. And I've seen reports of test systems that are up to 70% wall plug efficient. Um, optical fiber systems have amazingly good conversion of the pump energy to the laser, partly because for the particular systems that I'm interested in, which are terbium doped, there's a very small quantum defect, um, much, much smaller than for titanium sapphire systems. And also because you put the pump energy exactly where you need it, you pump in the core of the, of the optical fiber so that the pump energy is right there where it can, can be for, converted into, into laser output. And so what you can see is that this combination of diode pumping and high optical pump to laser conversion is that optical fiber systems can be 30 to 40% wall plug efficient. And if you compare that to the number I had earlier from the laser, the Bella laser system of 0.03%, you can see we've had an orders of magnitude increase in the efficiency of the laser system, which would make a huge difference to our, our, the efficiency of our accelerator overall, if we could use these systems. The problem is they're very small. You can imagine what a, an optical fiber looks like. So the output energies are low in the, the millijoule levels. And you, the, the numbers that we need to drive a, a plasma accelerator are in the tens of joules. So the solution to this is to take a, a large number of these individual optical fiber lasers and combine them together coherently. So one way of doing this that's been very successful is polarization combining. So what I do is I take two of my optical fibers, 
I amplify low energy inputs to um, higher energy inputs at the, uh, outputs at the end of them. And then I combine them into one bigger pulse by using polarization combination. And you can kind of see that that would stack together. <coughs> so I could take N small optical fibers and by um, creating a, a binary tree combination out of the end, I get a, a high intensity laser pulse. Now these all have to be phase controlled so that they add coherently, but this actually has been very successfully implemented um, across uh, eight and I believe now up to 16 optical fibers um, where we've got high repetition rates, millijoule outputs um, and high average powers. The problem with polarization combining, as you could see from my previous slide, is this doesn't scale gracefully, sort of two, four, eight fibers fit together quite nicely, but this doesn't scale well to large numbers of fibers. So there are some other options under investigation. So there's what's called tiled aperture combination, where instead of trying to add all of our beams on top of each other spatially, you just take the output of a large number of fibers and then combine them through a diffractive optical element so that you can combine them not in one beam that can be transported everywhere, but at a high peak uh, just at where you actually want to do your experiment. So this is just if, uh, if you know optics, then your output is the Fourier transform of the arrangement of light going into your combination system. So what you can do is you can take the output of many fibers and then use a, a diffractive optical element to collect and combine them together. And again, if these are phase controlled, you can have very high intensities in the central lobe. What you see here is the output of 64 fibers, which have been combined together in phase, giving you a high peak power in the, the central area. This is still lossy, of course, but um, this scales much, much better than the filled aperture systems that I was just showing you. You can just make your square of fibers to be combined much larger. So both of those two previous options required phase control. You can actually have passive combination that doesn't require the complexities of phase control, where you split laser pulses and send them in opposite directions around a loop where they can be amplified. And because the loop is the same length in either direction, they come out automatically amplified. Again, this doesn't scale particularly nicely for large numbers of, of pulses to be amplified or fibers, but it does take away the complexity of requiring phase control and feedback. You automatically get coherent combination this way. And then the last one I want to talk about is enhancement cavities where we take high repetition rate, low energy pulses, and then we stack these pulses in an optical cavity so that they um, coherently add to each other. And then at some point when a number of pulses have been added together, you can switch them out of the cavity and have a lower repetition rate, but uh, higher, pulse, uh, higher pulse energy laser from your, your low energy, um, high rep rate input. So there are a number of ways that people have thought about this. One of my absolute favorites is having a cavity with a spinning wheel in it with a mirror on it, so that every so often the, the mirror segment on the spinning wheel will intercept the uh, pulses which have been added together and divert them out of the cavity. And there is actually, although it looks, um, it looks a, a, a bit peculiar, people are actually working on this, this technique because this means that uh, you can really efficiently use all of the pulses out of a high repetition rate megahertz laser system. And there are, are proposed ways of using these to, to create lasers which have the requirements that would be needed to drive a laser wake field accelerator, but have all of the efficiency of the input fiber systems. And people are making, in practical terms, that the, it's difficult engineering, but people are producing these um, uh, really impressive um, optical cavities. And this is one that's being produced for the gamma source at the Eli system in Romania. So one, one final method is instead of having one fiber with one core, you can also make fibers which have multiple cores. So light is amplified at each of these fibers. And again, you have less to do in terms of phase control here because the pulses all see the same external environment. And this has also been shown to work and is a potentially promising way of getting high efficiency 
high average and peak power laser systems. So this has been hugely successful technology. I've put up some references here showing what's been achieved. But I think the important thing to note is that there's actually commercial systems now on these that are available. So you can buy something that uses this technology already, not up to the level to drive a plasma accelerator, but already utilizing, I think, 16 fibers um, in a turnkey laser system. So to summarize, to make the uh, laser wake field accelerators look viable in terms of their efficiency, we need to improve the laser sources. We don't have that yet, um, but in this talk, I have briefly given you a look at what the possible options are. And there are many other things to consider, but I think there's really promising research that shows that we can get over this hurdle of low efficiency lasers to make laser plasma acceleration interesting as a, as a potential acceleration technique uh, for machines, both from an efficiency point of view, as well as from its very high, uh, <clears throat> uh, very high gradient point of view. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laura. That was really very interesting. I must admit, I had no idea just how inefficient these laser systems were. So some enormous gains to be made there. We are um, running a little bit behind, but there. <clears throat> we'll just take one question, I think, because we need to move on. So this is from Osnur Apsiman. He said, uh, how would fiber optic components perform at high powers at the level of Bella? Would it still provide order of magnitude efficiency improvements? And what are the implications for high rep rate, perhaps regarding these damage limits? Uh, so the question of optics is a very good one. Um, we have optics that can withstand the high peak powers at the repetition rates we're using at the moment, so the quite a Hertz level. If you were able to move to these combined fiber systems that gave you kilohertz performance at the same peak powers, then yes, there are some very serious concerns about damage to optics and things like distortion due to thermal effects. And there are people looking at those as well. I wasn't able to cover this in this talk, but there's a lot of interest in compressor gratings and high damage threshold optics for exactly this. It's a, it's a good question and it is an area of active research that will have to be considered for these lasers to be usable. Okay, thank you. So if there are any other questions, perhaps, um take them offline or um, use the chat during the coffee break perhaps and we'll now move on to our final talk before um, the coffee break and this is on high speed high power solid state marks generators Syed Mohammed Aglan from Huddersfield University over to you Syed uh, hello everyone Hello everyone, uh, actually I'm Mohammed Degan from University of Huddersfield and uh, I'm going to talk about a high speed, high voltage solid state marks generator. Uh, the, pro the project is coming on uh, in the accelerator research group in University of Huddersfield under supervision of Professor Sevier and uh, uh, Mr. Steve Hans is my, our colleague in the RC com company. Uh, first, I, uh, I should uh, talk about the application we are working on. Uh, actually, the Ersel company is looking for a, a low price uh, system for photon, photon therapy. And uh, in this way, uh, we need a RSO for a 40 megahertz cavity, uh, which uh, ac uh, are going to ac accelerate uh, protons from 100 kilo electron volts to one mega electron volts. And uh, the reputation rate uh, should be around one kilohertz. Uh, for the actually uh, RF source, we, uh, we are uh, thinking about uh, a cheap uh, source and therefore we think about a, a Marx generator uh, because compared to other uh, RF sources, it should be uh, uh, inexpensive and uh, I, we can actually impl implement it in the lower prices. Uh, but uh, we have uh, two choice. Uh, first using conventional uh, mass generator and another one was uh, a solid state mass generator, but we choose the solid state because uh, 
because of their benefits, including a high reputation rate, blind life time, and efficiency. Uh, uh, using a uh, solid state, we can uh, control the pulse shape and uh, it uh, can offer a compact size maximator to us and the cost is going to be a moderate level. Uh, this uh, topology is the, actually a lot of uh, topology has been pro proposed by the uh, researcher from the solid state maximator, but we uh, choose this topology as you can see in the uh, slide. Uh, now uh, I just have the uh, four stage from uh, the, the maximator, uh, but in the reality, we are going to use a lot of more of this uh, kind of stage to reach our desired voltage. In the slide, the uh, uh, blue components are, are the main pan, uh, component of the, the mass generator, and, uh, but the green one is, are the uh, accessory uh, paths for providing the accessory power for gate driving the solid state switches. And I'm going to actually describe in the next slide more about this topology. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, max is going to work in two modes, the uh, charge mode and discharge mode. And uh, uh, first, uh, let's uh, look at the discharge mode. In the discharge mode, the, our lower switch, switches are going to be on. And in this way, our main capacitor is uh, going to connect it in series, series, and to in this way they apply will apply a high voltage to the load. But uh, in this in the charging mode, the upper the switches are uh, going to be on, and uh, and in this way the capac main capacitor are connected in parallel, and they are going to be char charged from the, our main uh, source power. Uh, of course, uh, we have another path for charging the, our accessory, accessory capac capacitors. As I said, they are going to provide the power for get driving. And you can see actually both the paths in the slide. And here uh, we have the, the specification we choose for our uh, application. Uh, the output voltage is going to be 720 kilovolts and the power speed uh, around 150 nanoseconds. Uh, store energy around 8 joules, car rating uh, 72 amps. Inst instantaneous power is uh, 360 kilowatts. And the application rate for these projects is going to be uh, 500 hertz. Uh, actually, we, we decided to choose 5 kilovolts for every stage based on the, uh, uh, the price and uh, the optimum topology we can choose for uh, the projects. We uh, just uh, reached to 5 kilovolts. And in this way, we need uh, 144 stages to reach the, our desired voltage. And maybe we can uh, have a, a look at the details of the uh, every module. As you can see, uh, I have four uh, switches, SIC switches for, actually SIC MOSFET. For every switch you can see in the uh, slide. Uh, we need uh, some uh, high speed uh, switches and therefore we, we cannot find a high voltage, high speed uh, switch in the, in the market. I mean, we try to use uh, four of uh, them in the series to uh, reach the five kilovolts voltage. And uh, as, I, as you can see, I, I've used uh, four, uh, 1,700 1, volts, 72 amps as IC MOSFET for lower switch. Actually, this is the charge, uh, discharging switch. And for 1,700 volts, uh, 5 amps as IC MOSFET for uh, the actually charging switch. Uh, 
for diodes, uh, we used uh, 11 600 volt, three amps ultra fast diodes in series to uh, make uh, uh, the, uh, high voltage diodes in the, this topology. And uh, for ma our main capacitor, we use for uh, 1,600 volts, 22 nanofarad capacitors in series to reach the, actually, and to form our uh, capacitor wank in every module. And uh, please uh, look at the uh, auxiliary power and signals. Actually, uh, one of the main uh, challenges in the making the solid state mass generator uh, is about uh, uh, providing the power and signals for uh, gate driving. Uh, and it, this is a very uh, challenging uh, event in the high voltage. Uh, for example, in, the, in, in our cases, it's around 700 kilowatts and making an insulation is very ha hard to reach. And therefore, uh, we use a fiber optic uh, to transfer the fiber signal from the uh, central control board to every module. Uh, and also we are uh, providing the power for every module from the accessory capacitor, as you can, as you can remember, uh, from uh, the green pass I see in the uh, max generator topology. And uh, in every module, we have uh, eight uh, MOSFET, and therefore we need uh, eight DC converters and gate driver, and the. Uh, in insulation level for every DC converter and gate drive is only five kilowatts instead of the 700 kilowatts uh, if we uh, don't uh, actually choose uh, fiber optic or, or don't choose this uh, accessory capacitors. And you can see, uh, uh, see uh, a 3D view of our uh, PCB board of every module and actually we are developing the, uh, this uh, max generator and, uh, and then uh, our design is finished and we are going to uh, implement this max generator in the very soon. Uh, now I have a, a efficiency calculation for the, this max generator. Uh, <sighs> To find the efficiency, we are looking at the charge and discharge modes separately. In the uh, charge uh, modes, the diodes and the, this uh, upper switch is going to be on. And in this mode, we are going, going to uh, consider only uh, conduction losses and we ignore from uh, switching losses. Uh, equivalent capacitor is going to be uh, around uh, 600 nanofarad and uh, for uh, reaching uh, 500, uh, 500 hertz uh, reputation rate, uh, the charging current should be around 1.58 amps. And it means every module experience uh, the challenge charging current up 11 milliamps. Uh, the diode we choose uh, the, uh, has a forward voltage around 1.3 volts, and it means the power loss is going to be around 151 watts for diodes, totally in for actually 144 stages. And uh, the under resistor for the uh, charging MOSFET is around one ohm, and it means uh, we uh, the power losses in the uh, uh, charging MOSFET is around 600 watts. But uh, in the discharge mode, is the only uh, char uh, discharging switch, and the, this lower switch is going to be on. And in this uh, mode, we just consider the switching losses and. Uh, 
ignore the conduction losses. Uh, if we can assume the current is, uh, uh, we assume the current is around uh, 50, uh, 72 amps, and in the, the hour switch we choose, the rise time is uh, 13 nanosecond and the fall time is 10 nanosecond, and it means the power loss is going to be uh, around uh, six, 370 watts. Uh, average power for uh, our box generator is around 4,000 watts, and it means efficiency is going to be 78%. Of course, it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, in, in the reality is going to be uh, less, uh, but uh, we are thinking about uh, replacing the uh, charging component of, uh, and in including the diodes and the charging MOSFET in the, with uh, some more efficient uh, parts in the future. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, Okay, thank you, Syed. And another very interesting talk. It looks like there are no questions, so I'll just ask uh, one briefly before we go for our break. Um, so what are your plans to build um, a prototype of this? Do you have plans to, to actually manufacture this? Yes, uh, actually we are now, uh... Uh, we are making a prototype in the uh, laboratory and uh, we ordered the PCV and we are making uh, this prototype is going to be maybe uh, uh, in, in, in one month or two months we are going to have the first our prototype of this uh, Max generator and uh, maybe first we are going to just try to uh, 50 kilowatts and uh, in the future, uh, we are going to develop that. Okay, thank you. So, thanks again for another interesting talk. And now we're going to have a refreshment and comfort break. Yeah, if we can come back at half past three, so 25 minute break. Um, and during the break, we've got a few rolling slideshows about the particle accelerator engineering network, if anyone wants to have a look at it and join the network. Hi, everyone. Uh, Welcome back uh, to this session. I'm just going to do a quick check and make sure we've got all our speakers. We are missing one that I will chase up as we are talking. Um, all right, so our, our first speaker um, in this session um, we we have uh, invited someone from outside the UK um, because of the exciting uh, work that was done in Sweden around um, um, energy efficiency of accelerators, reusing waste energy around the ESS project. Um, the next speaker is uh, Thomas Parker from Warm. I think I pronounced that right. There's a three in the middle of the name. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a warm or WAF VM, <laughs> but um, um, WARM is the federal company that came out of uh, the ESS uh, energy systems. Um, so we thought it would be a, a really important speaker to have at this workshop um, as ESS were, were so forward thinking 
um, about energy efficiency of accelerators way before anyone else was, uh, and Thomas was a key part of that. Um, he's now working for the Z War. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Thomas. Hey, thanks very much for that. Um, I, 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 I apologize, I couldn't join earlier. I'm, uh, I'm actually off, uh, I'm sitting in a ski lodge. I've forgotten my headset at home. So I hope, uh, can you hear me all right? Or at all? Yep, yep, can hear you fine. It's all good, all right. Uh, yeah, like, uh, um, like you said, I was at the, um, the ESS. It was it's six years ago now. Uh, we left that, and we we founded uh, the company Warm uh, with the idea of of um, bringing bringing the the concepts that we developed at ESS and and uh, particularly around uh, use of waste heat uh, to to industry starting in Sweden. Uh, so it's 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 a great great pleasure for me to be. Uh, talking to you guys now to be sort of back in the back in the business of uh, particle accelerators because I, I have to say I miss it a bit I miss the the science angle although uh, in industry is uh, fun in its way as well so it's 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 really a great treat for me to be here today um, well we did it going back to to ESS um, what was special there is that uh, there was a competition to host the ESS and the, the, the Swedish, Swedish and Danish governments uh, that were keen to host it um, pitched in that aside from paying huge wads of cash as, as, as one does, uh, also came up with saying that this would be a, a sustainable research facility. And uh, to achieve that uh, had an energy concept which is called responsible, renewable, recyclable. And I thought I'd just use that format to, to, to um, well, throw you a few thoughts today. Um, and, and the strength of that was that since this was part of the, the, the sort of competition to, to be allowed to host ESS, uh, the, this energy concept was given in a, in a written commitment from the Swedish government uh, to the other uh, 15 governments involved at the time. Uh, so that was a very useful tool to, for me as, as the energy uh, manager at this place to, to whack people about the head with and said that, listen, we need to deliver on these um, goals. And that actually brings me to the first, the first bit on this is responsible, where there was a uh, which was the word for the energy efficiency uh, part of this this three prong thing, uh, but uh, uh, while there was a lot of work done on the the um, various technical sides, um, um, various bits of the machine uh, where where um, inevitably lots of efficiency gains were made, what was quite clear to see was that. Uh, when um, a technological gain is made, there are various forces fighting for um, to benefit from that. And uh, of course, in the science field, we want to produce more science when we manage to make something technologically better. Uh, so, you know, typically for an accelerator, you want more bang for your buck, more powerful beams. Uh, and, and so there's a bit of a fight between, well, do we want more beam or do we want to become, you know, have the same, the same beam power, but more efficiently? And then you have budgetary issues. Do you want to save money with this increased efficiency? Do you, do you want to do that from the, uh, in your production budget or in your original investment budgets, which can be completely different budgets? And, and so the here, the, the fact that there was a promise to uh, between governments and just the highest level 
and and um, that we could that sort of forced us to actually uh, focus on gains in efficiency that became that we used uh, to become more energy efficient in total, and it it became a an important story internally in terms of ma management, but also externally, uh, which which helped us, uh, I think, um, ensure that we work together in in the facility so that we were uh, had common goals for our efficiency gains. Um, another energy management aspect, which I think that uh, perhaps is is overlooked by, by um, um, accelerators, physics, physicists, and those developing uh, these systems is that uh, some mundane things like scheduling can have a huge impact. Um, uh, in the UK, I know there's a half hour electricity market. Most of Europe have hourly markets, uh, particularly the UK market, um, at least last time I followed it, and this is a few years ago, so things might have changed, uh, but was quite volatile. So that uh, electricity prices can change um, substantially or dramatically even uh, between one half hour and the next. And uh, some of that was um, is perhaps difficult to predict and to adjust to, and um, a half hour can be a short time in, in research and difficult to adjust to, but there are also long-term um, uh, planable uh, events. Uh, so we at ESS, we had some, some really interesting discussions about to, when to schedule shutdowns uh, in, and uh, looked at the effect on energy markets of choosing a uh, time for that. And uh, um, in Sweden, and I'm, I'm not sure about the UK, but in, in Sweden, um, it's a cool climate. Uh, so energy demand goes up in winter. Uh, Southern Europe, uh, you know, warm parts in the globe, energy use goes up in the summer because it's air conditioning. Uh, but in, in Sweden, it's, it's very much in the, in, the, in the winter. And so that we... Um, uh, we're first thinking we time a shutdown uh, uh, so that we wouldn't shut down in winter. But then since we had in, in, at ESS, we had uh, heat recycling to the district heating system uh, in, in the concept. And, and they were really keen to get heat in the winter for the same reason. Uh, so there was some discussions about, okay, how do the electricity prices vary? How do, would the, the value of the heat vary? What can we get for that? At different times, and uh, so it turns out moving moving shutdowns could achieve uh, as much and with far less pain than than um, uh, technological uh, gains. Uh, and this will vary depending on you know localization. Uh, UK will be different from Sweden, but different places in the UK could also be different depending on how your market looks. Uh, but there are people that. Uh, follow this quite intensely. Uh, there are uh, in, and people who, who spend their lives trading various derivatives. Uh, so that can be somewhere to, to seek some uh, interesting crossovers. Um, ESS had a very specific uh, renewable energy goal and it was to, to use 100% renewable energy. Uh, in, in Sweden, that's rather easy in a way because you, you can just uh, make a contract for that. It's a, it's a phone call. I, I think the UK probably has similar instruments, at least today. Uh, but um, just a, a, a sort of renewable stamp on it was not deemed sufficient. Uh, the, the ESS management at the time insisted that we should own our own renewable uh, production. Uh, and that was a bit of a trick because we had no budget for that at all. Um, but then we saw that this is a, a facility, it's going to be used well, around 250 gigawatt hour of power per year. It's planned to run for 20 years. It's, it's owned by 
17 European governments, um, some of them with fairly solid uh, financials. So we had absolutely awesome uh, purchasing power. So we could get anything we wanted from the market, really. Um, and, and so what we said is like, okay, look, we were willing to use this to say, to uh, put a long-term electricity contract and to get that you need to build new um, renewable power for us and uh, then we allowed to buy the power and there's there are issues of balancing because if it's wind power the wind doesn't always blow and all that and all that was in it and then finally after 20 years um, ESS gets to own the facility so that just achieved that goal. And, and this has changed since that. That was the concept at the time. Point is that if you put together your the the, uh, the purchase and your if you're government backed or or you know somehow you build a particle accelerator, it usually has some sort of pretty long-term backing, you can funnel that purchasing power to place some high demands on um, on uh, the, a supplier and and what those will look at look like that's a, a question that you need to discuss at the particular facility uh, finally the the recyclable bit and this turned out to be the trickiest uh, uh, if depending on where you are in the world um, waste heat could be a valuable resource um, However, uh, my experience is that uh, particle accelerators generally don't like to be cooled at, at very high temperatures. Uh, it tends to be uh, um, uh, a bit on the low side for the waste heat to be useful. Although we did do a fair amount of work at ESS uh, looking at um, cooling different parts of klystrons. Uh, at different temperatures, and then we could get out some um, some little higher grade waste heat that way, uh, which was more directly useful. Uh, but even if you have uh, 40 degrees, uh, which is not uncommon, uh, that can be used for space heat. It's uh, which is not difficult if you're if you're using it for some new use. Uh, so we actually had a, a, a plan, which may still happen at ESS, to um, sell or, or give away the waste heat and uh, had a, a greenhouse grower from, from Holland who was willing to, to um, move up and uh, build a huge greenhouse facility to run on the waste heat. Uh, so it's, it's actually not very difficult if you uh, design it to begin with. But uh, and I spent some time at, at, at CERN, for instance, and other places, and looked at that, uh, if they could use uh, their waste heat, just heat the buildings on site, because uh, there's a few of them. Uh, but the difficulty is that when you've, you have an old building, uh, you, the size of, of radiators, heat exchangers, and, and distribution systems is designed for higher temperature heat, then you have to you have to redo all that to be able to use your um, your recycled heat, and, and that costs money. And not it's not a huge amount of money. It could probably pay for itself quite quickly uh, because you suddenly have free heat. But if you're a you know a government uh, facility, you work on that sort of a budget regime. Um, you you can't just uh, hand in a uh, investment calculation, even if there is some profit. Um, in it long term, uh, in 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 my experience, and so it, there, it, it can be annoying to retrofit. Now there are um, companies you go to, so called ESCOs, uh, who might be willing to make those investments and then sell. Basically, you pay for it out of your your future um, uh, heating bill, but but if you're building something new, this is really low hanging fruit, and if you if you're you're, you're cooling waste heat and simultaneously have a, a gas boiler, then you're not doing things right. The, so that's kind of a, I would say an easy, 
easy fix, uh, much, much easier than uh, making a more efficient uh, accelerator. Um, so uh, just to round off, um, one thing that I really quite enjoyed um, and uh, got a lot out of uh, at ESS was um, that uh, people all across Europe and indeed all across the globe were starting to get together and wanted to uh, talk about um, uh, energy efficiency and, uh, and, and sustainability generally in, in big science. And uh, so there were a lot of people sort of tentatively uh, reaching out and, and trying to find uh, our friends in a network. And I understand that's grown uh, tremendously over the last few years since I've been, been out of that space. Um, uh, but, uh, and also in my opinion, sadly, uh, you guys are no longer part of the EU. And uh, so that is, is, I guess, one space not quite so available. Uh, but um, I, I had um, the, the pleasure of co-founding a, a workshop entitled Energy for Sustainable Science. Um, I, it's still up and running every two years. Uh, they get together. We started, I think, in 2013 in, in Lund. I, and and um, the hosting of it uh, revolves. Uh, as far as I know, it's not yet in the UK. Uh, and and I don't know, I'm not saying, I don't know if it's good still or if it's useful to you or you probably already know about it, but and I just want to throw that out there that um, it, it is, um, you know, once this pandemic is over, it is nice to get out of the house sometimes and, and compare notes with someone um, with similar thoughts somewhere else. Um, I put just in my slide, I put um, uh, some publications, uh, I just threw them in there, uh, mostly maybe for finding some names, uh, some, some friends was my idea. Uh, so that's a little from the ESS and I, I skipped real quickly in the beginning, I wanna say that if you do wanna work with waste heat um, and uh, that what we do at WARM, uh, we've been, we're working right now uh, only in Sweden, uh, but we, we are interested in, uh, in, in UK business as well. So if you, you, you have a fair amount of waste heat, if you're a sizable facility and want to see if there are opportunities there, then uh, reach out, just uh, fire off an email or something and we can uh, have a quick look if there's, if there's something we can do. So thanks very much for that. And I don't know what we're doing about questions, but I'd be pleased to answer any if you have any. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I'll remind the audience that they can submit questions via the Q&A section down in the bottom. Um, so while well, I'm waiting for some questions to come in, Thomas, so how much, what's the sort of ratio of waste heat produced to energy stored and heating other things are waste heat, and how efficient is that process? What? Sorry. What? How? How efficient is waste heat to compared to waste? No, I mean waste heat. The ratio of sort of energy saved from your heating bill to waste heat energy from the accelerator. Well, um, we got hold of. Um, I mean, if you look at, we, we were thinking we'd have like, um, we were use, gonna use um, around 250 gigawatt hours of power per year. And, and we, got, we got hold of most of that. Uh, I can't remember the numbers, but I think it was like, uh, it's on the order of 200 uh, gigawatt hours in, in the cooling systems. Yeah. And, and um, so, so that was f fairly good. If you look at uh, comparing with industry now, you have the heat sort of dissipates everywhere, but with um, uh, accelerator systems, you have the, the cooling pretty much spot on. So it, it's, that's fairly efficient to collect it. And then in, um, in terms of on the heating side, um, you have some, you need to pump the water around and you need some 
rather large um, uh, irradiators or and heat exchangers and that sort of thing. But 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 the heat doesn't you lose some heat in the way you have some insulation. But that's a that's an efficient system. I mean you're not. Uh, I mean it's it's heat, right? It it there are no lower forms of energy. It just stays as heat. You just need to get it to the right place. I mean, does it? Do you have to do any additional steps? Like, I mean, obviously the water underfloor heating probably happens at one temperature, and your waste heat maybe a different temperature. Is is that an easy enough thing to to sort? Yeah, yeah. That's why. It, I mean, that's why. Um, I'm saying that that 40 degrees that's perfectly adequate for for underfloor um, heating. Um, you'll it's not enough for your tap water because of uh, uh, you know Legionnaires' disease that uh, sort of thing. So there's a usually a legal requirement uh, and a good one to um, uh, bring it up to 50 or 55. So there you'd need to to bring the temperature up a bit. Um, by a sun system, but but uh, for just space heating, um, if you design in like floor heating, like you're saying to begin with, it's real easy. Uh, but to retrofit, uh, it's just a, annoying. Uh, it just gets uh, a lot of a lot of investment uh, that is just not fun. Okay, we have a question from Spencer Kelly. How significant is the loss in efficiency if you want to transport the waste heat? Over say two hundred meters. Mm, uh, good question. Um, uh, two hundred meters, I would say, is doable uh, in our um, in uh, warms um, in the business we do, and we we go to like big industries, so there's lots of heat. Um, so, don't, but but just in terms of uh, cost, we say more than a kilometer. That becomes um, a bit tricky. Uh, but 200 meters, uh, if if you have some uh, some scale to it, uh, that's doable. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. I think it, um, but nowadays it's obligatory if you have an energy efficiency workshop, you've got to get the uh, ESS warm talk. <laughs> so thank you very much, especially as you were on your uh, skiing vacation. Oh, it was a real pleasure. All right. Um, so our next speaker is Peter Williams from Aztec and STFC, and he's going to be talking about energy recovery Linux. Okie dokie. Uh, right, so. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, can see it fine. It's not in presentation um, view yet, but can see you speak. Is it not? I don't know. Hang fire. Let me try again. How about that? Yeah, I can see a desktop not in presentation view yet. That's enough. Is it coming? Screen now. Hmm. Yeah, it's on full screen. Oh, great. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, back to talking about the accelerators themselves um, and the details of them. I'm going to talk about um, recovering the power from the beam itself, and that has a name. It's called the Energy Recovery Linac. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and give you a brief overview um, of the whole field of Energy Recovery Linac. So, so bear with me. Um, right, so what is an energy recovery Linac? Oh, okay, so if we think about the, um, the types of electron accelerators, uh, these are all electron accelerators that we're thinking about now. Um, first off, we could have a, a linear accelerator. And um, if you see my little diagrams here, the green boxes are 
where your beam starts and the red boxes are where it ends and the blue boxes are your accelerating cavities. Um, so your linear accelerator, there's the most simple thing that you could draw. Um, what are the characteristics of that? Well, you get an excellent beam quality out of a LINAC and you can do what you like with the beam when it comes out of it because it doesn't affect what's gone before. But your beam current is limited and that is because you are accelerating these bunches every time you move from one end to the other and then you're throwing all of that energy away. And because of that, it's expensive. So many accelerators are circular um, and they come in various flavors, cyclotrons, synchrotrons, storage rings. And the great thing about circular accelerators is that you can have a high average beam current um, because you're reusing it, well, not infinite times, but certainly very many times, um, 10 to the 11 at least times. However, um, the beam quality is limited and that is because it is a, an equilibrium system. We've got collective effects and things going on like synchrotron radiation. And it's also beam disruption limited. So you can't um, rip your beam apart at your interaction point. Um, you have to be able to circulate it. That's called the lifetime and storage ring. But is there a halfway house? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, the first thing that you might think of doing is taking your linear accelerator and making it cheaper. And you could do that by, instead of accelerating each bunch once through your LINAC, um, you accelerate it multiple times. And this is called a recirculating LINAC. The microtrons are also an example of that. So you keep the qualities of your LINAC, um, the excellent beam quality, and you nearly keep your tolerance to beam disruption. And you've saved some money because you can go to higher energy with the same amount of accelerating cavities, but your beam current is still limited uh, because you are throwing away all of the energy as beam at the end. Okay, so then the magic step is that you move your red box, and uh, watch this move, over to the other side here. And now this is an energy recovery LINAC. And the yellow box indicates where you are using your beam for some uh, application. And the difference is you take your beam from your application and you put it back into the LINAC and you decelerate it again. And in that way, you keep your excellent beam quality at the interaction point. Um, you retain your tolerance on beam disruption. And now because you're recovering the majority of the energy from a beam, you can whack up the current and get currents very similar to storage rings. Okay. So here's a, uh, another illustration of the process. Um, it's a game of pass the parcel. So you, you take your beam from your injector, you put it through your LINAC and you'll notice the word here, superconducting. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then you get your beam, you've accelerated it up to the top energy, you use it in some way and then you direct it back down the LINAC, recover all of the energy out of it, and then take it to dump. So, of course, the reason that this is superconducting is because you're taking the energy and you're swapping it from one bunch to the next bunch to the next bunch to the next bunch, okay? Because the next bunch is going to come out of here, and the fields that you've regenerated in this cavity are then going to accelerate the next bunch. So of course that means you need to have a high quality factor. So it's ideal for superconducting RF technology. So just as an illustration, this is from our old machine at Darsbury called Alice. And this is the gradient demand RF traces. And in this left-hand plot, we have the beam coming through in this point and it draws power from the LINAC. And this is because we have um, a block in this bit here to stop the beam getting back into the LINAC. And as soon as you release that block and allow the beam to go back through the LINAC, then your gradient demand traces flatten off uh, to zero, essentially. Okay, so why are they so great? Um, why 
do we want these things? Well, they, they widen the applications of accelerators because you can provide nearly linear quality or brightness beam at nearly storage ring beam powers. Okay, so the power in the beam can be much greater than the RF power that you have available. And the quality of the beam is actually source limited. So it depends what kind of emittances you can produce from the injector at the very beginning. And these are generally much less than the equilibrium emittance from, uh, for example, a storage ring. It also allows you to um, think about radiation control because of course, if we want to dump our beam, we're dumping our beam at low energy and we could choose that energy to be below um, some threshold, for example, um, neutron separation thresholds. So we don't have, if we have a high power beam, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to generate lots of radioactive waste, which of course is very expensive to deal with. So the examples that I'm gonna use you here, um, I'm gonna show you some where we take this high power drive beam and we are able to use that without increasing the, um, without increasing the RF drive power that we need. And that allows us to consider high power applications of electron beams and that would otherwise be unaffordable for and my biggest example involved gigawatt class beams okay so the thing to remember is erls you can use them whenever you need a beam that has simultaneous high quality and high average power okay so the following examples i'm going to show you from the world of light sources and compton sources and in nuclear and particle physics Okay, so because this is a bit of an overview, I'm going to give you a, a now and later view um, of where we are as a field. And where we are now is that in, in Earls applied to light sources and in particular free electron lasers, um, we have been able to produce um, kilowatts, many kilowatts um, average power yeah, as an infrared FEL, and the, um, the prime example of this is the Jefferson Lab FEL program. Um, and this ran up until 2013. And this is a picture of the, of the bunker at Jefferson Lab. And of course, you look at the topology and it's similar to what I've showed you here is the LINAC. Um, these, this is the recirculation line. And then there, are, there were two um, user areas, one an infrared FEL and one a UV FEL, and then of course the beam comes back down and is dumped here. And at Darsbury we had a similar program up until 2017, um, and this is a picture of our machine Alice, um, as was. This was the first energy recovery LINAC in Europe, and it ran the first multi-year user program on an energy recovery LINAC, and again you can see the topology here, this is the injection line, these are our superconducting cavities, and it's this line here that brings you around. And then our user area was here where we had our free electron laser and various other applications. And around the world, there are obviously still some projects on wing um, and going from strength to strength, one of which is in Japan at KEK. This is called the Compact URL. And this was originally just a test facility for energy recovery Linux and now now they've had some additional funding to expand this to a free electron laser program in some research for industry. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And at Novizbirsk in Russia, they've for many years now run um, a non-superconducting, um, really a recuperator rather than an energy recovery LINAC. But nevertheless, they recover the majority of the energy from the beam. And they use this to drive a suite of terahertz and infrared free electron lasers for biological research. And this is a very complex machine. Um, and of course, the Russians have to do things very differently, um, making lives difficult for themselves um, by mounting it all on the ceiling, going in both transverse planes, both horizontally and vertically, um, just to show that they're very clever. Okay, so where are we going um, in ERLs for light sources? Well, one of the potential applications is, is actually an industry in, in semiconductor lithography. And the reason for this is because the semiconductor industry wants to um, make their chips ever smaller. 
And the etching process that is used to make semiconductor chips, of course, demands light that is around about the same sort of wavelength as the, um, as the size of the electronic components. And as these get smaller, you want to make shorter wavelength light. And that becomes very difficult when you get down to the extreme ultraviolet. Um, so there's been some uh, interest in industry that's um, been on and off. Um, looking at the idea of using high average power FEL um, to be the light sources for the stepper machines in semiconductor chip factories around the world. And so that's one future application. And of course, because this has to be high average power, an energy recovery LINAC would be what would drive such a thing. Um, in terms of research, we've looked at uh, incorporating energy recovery Linux into the UK X-ray free electron laser um, proposal um, that was recently published. Uh, and in here we can see, we've, we've drawn a diagram here of the, of the areas from the science case that would be addressed by various forms of the machine. So for example, so this is the photon energy along this axis and maximum number of pulses per second. And of course the energy recovery Linux, it's right up here at the top. And here we have that application of EUV lithography, uh, but it's not the only one up here. There are other aspects um, who are interested in very high repetition rates. Um, for example, condensed phase, condensed phase photoelectron spectroscopy um, and some others. Okay, so I'm conscious about my time. Um, another application is, in, is um, inverse Compton scattering. And what this is, is instead of using your electron beam to drive um, spontaneous sources of free electron laser, um, you have an external uh, solid state laser and collide your electron beam with your uh, laser beam. And why an energy recovery LINAC is useful here is because of course this small Compton cross section um, can be compensated for by the high average beam current that you can produce. And uh, because of course you can build electron accelerators up to GeV, energy scales, then the you can it becomes a very um, attractive method of generating high energy photon beams, gamma rays. Um, and at the moment, um, so, 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 so up until now, there's been X-ray demonstrations. We did one on Alice, uh, Compton scattering de demonstration at X-ray. And there's also been one at KEK, and this is an image that they produced a fly uh, with their Compton backscattered X-rays using their energy recovery Linux. Um, and where are we going? Um, well, there's a few facilities around the world that are interested in, in scaling this up to gamma rays. Um, the Pearl facility I'm going to mention on mention later on, that's a test facility for an LHEC. And we have a program at Dosbury looking into applications um, connected to UK XFEL, but not necessarily could be an initial stage of a UK XFEL. Um, where we're working in collaboration with AWE, looking at uh, gamma rays um, in applications such as nuclear resonance, fluorescence, and, and photovision. And then the final example is in nuclear and particle physics. And where we are now um, is um, the exemplar facility is just under construction at the moment called Maser um, at Mainz in Germany. And they are going to use an energy recovery LINAC uh, to do dark matter searches. And so here's your energy recovery LINAC here. And in the highest energy pass, they pass it through this spectrometer here um, called MAGIX. And this is an internal target nuclear physics experiment. Um, so they have a gas target and they pass the electron beam through it. And there is some disruption, but not enough that it would spoil the energy recovery process. And they use this, um, with a spectrometer to search for, for dark photons. And this is a program that's gonna be starting very soon. That picture of the construction site is actually two years old now. So I, I think it's it's moved on further, further from that picture. And where are we going? Where are we going in nuclear particle physics? Well, one exciting application is uh, as a beam cooler for hadrons. And um, so for the upcoming electron ion collider project at Brookhaven, um, that uses the old uh, the Rick tunnel at Brookhaven, there's a requirement to cool hadron beams. So this means make their phase space smaller. Um, and in, in in order to do that, you need to put your hadrons in a bath of cooler liquid, and that cooler liquid is an electron beam. 
um, and you need an energy recovery LINAC in order to provide um, the high quality, very cold, um, high current beam to do that. And there's been a test of this at CBETA um, at Cornell. And in fact, this was the world's first demonstration of multi-pass um, energy recovery LINAC. And this, they did this last year, um, year before last actually. Um, so that's the first application in nuclear particle physics. Then you might think of building in a full collider using an energy recovery LINAC. And there are a couple of proposals for this, the most developed of which is called the Large Hadron Electron Collider. So this is, this is, the, this is the LHC here. And then these racetracks are, are potential sites for an energy recovery LINAC 60 GeV um, electron beam facility. And, and why is it useful to do this, use an energy recovery LINAC? Well, because you can get to much higher luminosities um, than you would for the same amount of, electron, uh, of electric power. Um, so, and another example, Another example of this is, is if you were to think about building an even larger collider like the FCC EE using an energy recovery LINAC, um, then there's a nice comparison here. This, this, this red line is the luminosity of the baseline FCC EE uh, going down here um, as a function of square root of S, which is the um, center of mass beam energy. Um, so this green line here is a comparison um, of what you could achieve using an energy recovery LINAC instead of a storage ring. Um, and it, I, the guy that did this, Vladimir, he's unfortunately made this slightly confusing because this pink line dissipates 100 megawatts to synchrotron radiation, whereas this green line, he's only decided to dissipate 30 megawatts. If this were to be, um, if, if you were to choose the same point here, the same luminosity, um, then you would only dissipate 10 megawatts. So this is a, a, a way of building an FCC, uh, but only dissipating 10% of the power uh, to synchrotron radiation. Okay, so um, I think I'm very much nearly out of time, uh, so I won't go on here, but the, the point here is that we've, we've got uh, megawatts, we've proved megawatt beams. Um, we're in the process of showing 10 megawatt beams in the future, 100 megawatts and one gigawatt beams are what's required. Okay, so there's a bunch of technologies um, and of course I've run out of time. What people are working on in particular are high current low emittance CW injectors, um, an example of a DC in photo injector and an SRF photo injector. Um, this relies greatly on superconducting RF technology and the examples that I'm showing here from the Pearl program. So there are some uh, superconducting RF cavity structures here and um, that are suscept that are useful for energy recovery LINACs in that they um, have high beam breakup thresholds. Um, and this, these are some testing results, um, some fairly recent testing results. Um, there's a, a program at the moment to modify an SP, the SPL cryo module um, for use as an energy recovery LINAC cryo module. And there's also some work um, on ferroelectric fast reactive tuners. And this would, be, this would be very important technology for energy recovery LINAX because I lied slightly. Um, you can't recover all of the energy all of the time um, because there are things like microphonics and of course dynamic effects in cavities. Um, and one way of mitigating that is to make sure that you can tune very fast. And there's some uh, plots here from Nick Shipman at CERN who's studying the effects of, of the application of fast reactive tuners um, to the Pearl and LHEC projects. Okay, um, I could talk about the design of arcs, uh, but I won't. Uh, I could talk about the filling patterns, uh, but I won't because I'm running out of time. Really, I'd want to say that ARLs are, are promising a step change in the capabilities of electron accelerators by providing high quality beams uh, like a LINAC with a storage ring like average power. And why now? Well, it's a demand and supply thing. Um, the demand is, well, in contrast to storage rings, ERLs are non-equilibrium systems. So the beam dynamics of them are challenging. So don't go there unless you need to. Um, and now we need to, so there's the demand. And then the supply is, of course, none of this would be possible without well-developed superconducting RF technology. 
um, and this has been now 40 years in the making uh, and is now really industrially uh, there. Where are we going next? Well, ERLs have been identified um, by the European Strategy for Particle Physics as one of the five critical accelerator R&D topics. And at the moment we have these panels and we've been charged to produce a roadmap um, to guide accelerator investments in R&D in the coming years. Um, so please look out for this. And if it is in your uh, skill set, get involved. And, and that's all I've got to say. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, again, I mean, the audience can ask questions using the Q&A app. Uh, but while we're waiting, um, one thing I've always wondered, Peter, with an ERL, how do you start it? Because obviously at the start, for the first pass of electrons, there is no recovery. Yeah. Um, do you get a very large transient at the start, or is there some procedure of starting up with a slow ramp? So the, that's the dynamic effects that I was talking about. So the idea would be that you you don't start out with your full repetition rate. Um, you start out by ramping it up slowly and allowing the RF system to uh, follow you. So, um, so yes, there are dynamic effects during startup and ramp down that you, that, yes, it's an important part of the design process. Okay. Um, do you have any other questions for Peter? <coughs> I mean, are there any ERLs that, that um, for some of the high energy physics stuff that will like, likely to be built soon, or are they all still quite far off? Other um, than that dark float stick one? Uh, so, so um, in the near term, the most pressing demand is in terms of beam cooling for the electron ion collider. Yeah. Um, that is something that is going to have to get seriously addressed within the next year or two. Um, and there's various programs underway um, at Brookhaven and <laughs> we're looking to um, other labs internationally as well um, to contribute to that effort. Um, the fact that ERLs have been <coughs> one of these five categories for the European strategy, um, I think is encouraging. Um, the LHEC is um, promising from the point of view of it being um, much cheaper and able to be implemented quicker than, for example, an FCC. Um, so it's something that can coexist with the high luminosity LHC. Um, so that's that's another area to look out for in the near future. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Now, uh, the speaker who's advertising the program uh, hasn't turned up and we <laughs> haven't responded to emails today. Um, so um, we will have to move on to our next speaker. Um, which is Mike Glover, who is also from STSE, but is from ISIS. And he's going to talk uh, about um, the ISIS efficiency savings, the energy monitoring consumption. So, hi. Uh, apologies for not talking about high temperature superconductors, but uh, energy use in general, basically. So, let me just share my screen. Right, so hopefully you can see my introduction slide. It implies that this is something we're already doing. It's not, it's something we want to do. We're in the process of doing, and hopefully over the next few slides, I'll talk about why we want to do it and what we're actually gonna do. So ISIS uh, as a whole, when we're operational, we use just over 11 megawatts of power, 11.2 megawatts. And if you take our operational cycles of uh, about six weeks, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, five of those cycles throughout the year with shutdowns, we get up to 85 gigawatt hours per annum of electricity usage. And that figure, I should say, is purely what we use to run the accelerator. So not included in that figure at this moment in time is the energy used for the data centers. I mean, the output from our accelerator is science research. 
that's data and that all goes off to data center in in large quantities of data so at some point in the future we need to start thinking about that energy usage as well when we're not operational we drop down normally to around about three megawatts um, but in the covid lockdown we were almost in a sort of deep sleep mode and we were just below two megawatts and one of the things that we do want to start doing is to get our design engineers to start thinking about two modes of operation for the kit that they're designing um, at the moment they're really just designing for operations and they're not really thinking about sort of standby mode and if we can also reduce the energy that we use in the standby mode then that's only going to be a benefit to us and it's hard to talk about uh, electricity and energy usage without tying in carbon footprint nowadays so using um, co2 equivalence calculations throughout the year then we will generate a carbon footprint of just under 22,000 tons and um, it's very much out of date this slide but it gives you some idea of why we're interested in trying to make ourselves more efficient so obviously electricity consumption in the accelerator world is dominated by CERN um, and then all, most of the other machines are sort of dwarfed down there basically but you can see ICE is at number three and again that's, that's showing the 85 gigawatt per annum but as a percentage and that's at this time just under 15 percent of our operational costs and that's a figure which is only ever going to go up as the cost of electricity increases so we need to try and control it some easy wins for us at the moment is we're working together with the states to install pv panels um, but we're only considering installing those on the roofs of our facilities we're not going to install them on some of the green fields which are around by us because those fields can be used for science research in the future, future facilities. And the PV panels that we are in the process of putting in, so we're putting in PV panels on the roofs of two of our buildings, R6 and R80, but we're also thinking about some of the few buildings in the future that we can install these panels on. And the two buildings R6 and R80 will on a sunny day give us just over a megawatt of electricity now that doesn't reduce our uh, make us more efficient but it does mean that we're producing that electricity on site so it does improve our carbon footprint from the calculations we can uh, very definitely negate the transmission part of that calculation and we can use the green energy uh, calculation as opposed to the overall general. Some of the other things that we're also doing at this moment in time is we've recently come towards the end of a refurbishment of the ISIS facility. We started operations in the mid 80s and, and probably until about five years ago, most of the systems that we were operating on were the originals. Um, and when you start to operate on 30 year old equipment, you get very sensitive about switching it off uh, in shutdowns unless you really have to. It's a bit like an old car. You know that it's gonna switch off. You're not 100% certain whether it's gonna switch back on again. But with the upgrades, we've gained that certainty. And depending on the length of the shutdown, we can drop our energy usage down by about a factor of 75% in long shutdowns, 40% uh, in the shorter one week shutdowns. And you can even see that impact um, on our 24 hour maintenance days that occurs within the middle of our operational cycles. We are also working uh, a lot on some of the ancillary systems. So we've replaced the Demon water chillers for the LINAC, and that's given us 160 megawatt hours per annum energy savings. We've actually reduced the number of cooling water circuits as well. 
uh, again a benefit of 860 megawatt hours and currently we're at, in June we'll be going into a long shutdown and for that long shutdown they're aiming to replace some of the DC power supplies on the RS systems with pulse powers and that should give us a benefit of in the order of a gigawatt uh, per annum. There we go. And we're also in the process of working with the states and this particular project will be central to our um, thought process in the future basically. So we know that we're using 11.2 megawatts. We can calculate on paper at the moment where that 11.2 megawatts is going but what we can't do is confirm that. So we're working with the states to increase the amount of remote data monitoring on the electricity systems and also on the water consumption meters. That will give us better uh, data and we can then analyze that to understand. It's easy to, to highlight say the RF systems and the amount of energy that they use. It's more difficult to understand the energy usage of the distributed system so whether that's the vacuum system which is distributed throughout several buildings or the water cooling systems ventilation as well so we can start to identify those systems and we can see for example is the water cooling system respondingly uh, responding accordingly to the dimming process in the shutdown so is the energy used in the water cooling system also coming down by a similar amount. If it's not we can try and understand why and we can start to do something about it. And we can also identify simple things like the energy consumption for a Newton beam line. Now that's going to be a three to four year project. We've got something like 15 substations that power the ICES facility and we have it in the order of 8,000 electrical circuits. We're not planning to remote monitor all 8,000 electrical circuits but obviously we need to get down to the point where we can identify individual systems. We're also starting to get the design engineers to think about energy efficiency as part of the project management process. And that takes two forms. One is that they need to understand that they will have an energy budget. And within that energy budget, can they incorporate best in class design principles? So highlighted here, for example, is electric motors, um, the I sorry the EU have classified uh, electric motors into currently four classes with the most efficient being IE4 and um, sometime in 21 they will bring out class IE5 and there will be legislation whether that's applicable to the UK is not known at this moment in time but there will be legislation that says for example in future all motors that you use must be a minimum class of IE2 or IE3. Motors seem a strange thing to pick on but if you think about it um, there's lots of motors in use in various systems and the electricity consumption for those motors is particularly high when you um, sum them up into the overall uh, electricity generation. And the, the other aspect of building it into project management is to get them to start thinking that it's a, a design parameter for them to control and it's also a design parameter which they can negotiate. So if you've developed a new RF system, uh, a new klystron valve that requires 200 kilowatts of cooling, it's probably going to be a different design team which is de designing and building that cooling system. In the past, they would have just been given that parameter and a delta T, for example, that is required. Now, it may be in the future that they, they can negotiate, probably not so much on the 200 kilowatt figure, but they can start to negotiate on the delta T so that then they can be in a position to consider whether that waste heat in the cooling can actually be used for other purposes. 
and we want to introduce a whole life cycle approach to the design side of things. So we've just started a pilot project, which is um, an upgrade of the Synchrotron RF cavity coolant system. And it's not just thinking about the carbon footprint of the, the design and the operation of that system throughout its lifetime, but it's thinking about the carbon footprint that goes into the manufacturing of the materials that we then use to build the system. So whether that's the aluminium tubing, whether it's the steel, whether it's the motors, um, and from that we can build a whole carbon footprint um, that we can understand uh, the resources that we're actually using to design and build equipment for the ICES facility. And one of the reasons that we want to do that is basically to avoid displacement. It's uh, very simplistic on the slide, but uh, a lot of people think that if they buy an electric car, then they're green, they're carbon neutral. But the energy to power that car has got to come from somewhere. So they're offsetting, but they're also um, putting the carbon footprint for their mileage onto somebody else. So they're moving it from one life cycle to another. One of the reasons why this is um, keen, we're keen on this area at this moment is I've talked about ICES 1, but we're also starting to think of ICES 2. ICES 2 will be uh, a megawatt beam facility and all of a sudden uh, our energy consumption and these are only estimates at the moment, but goes from 11 megawatts to in the region of 30 megawatts. Therefore, our carbon footprint goes to 58,000 tonnes. So for RICES 1, the energy consumption back in the 1980s was very definitely an output for the design process. We recognise, as Thomas has already mentioned in his talk earlier, that for a new facility such as ICES 2, that energy and resources will have to be a design parameter that we will actively manage. Uh, we will probably have to set an energy budget. We will have to have policies on energy and the environment, carbon and biodiversity. Obviously have to comply with uh, local and national government regulations but it also raises the possibility that um, this approach will very definitely have operational expenditure benefits. It should reduce our energy uses, so therefore the operational cost should be less, but it may also have capital expenditure benefits as well. And that's something we're working on at this moment. And Thomas mentioned um, some workshops, Energy for Sustainable Science, and this is a statement that's come out from those workshops, in that there will be no future large-scale science project without an energy management component, an incentive for energy efficiency and energy recovery among the major objectives. And there's two reasons for that statement, in that the statement is recognising that to get the go-ahead to build these facilities we need to convince the government that we're taking this approach but also an equally important energy efficiency carbon footprint has a high public profile so we also need to convince the public the benefits that come from building these facilities and so far I've talked about energy efficiency and that's on the input side of the equation. What we're also trying to do, and to be honest, we don't really know how to do this yet, is to identify the carbon benefits from the research that we do. So if it's um, research on one of the beam lines for the next generation of lithium batteries, it possibly could be fairly straightforward to calculate the carbon footprint benefit for, for that research. If it's research into animal feed for aquatic animals, then it's difficult to equate that to a carbon footprint savings. There is obviously one there because if you're 
using less feed, you're having to manufacture less feed. So that's where the carbon benefits will come into it. But how you actually go about doing that equation, we're not certain at this moment in time. And Thomas mentioned earlier about the workshop Energy for Sustainable Science. So I've been to three of those so far. The last one uh, was in 2019 at uh, PSI in Switzerland. The next one um, will be this autumn and it's still on the schedule for this autumn and that will be at the ESRF at Grenoble. Whether that is an uh, on-site in-person meeting or whether it's all on Zoom or whether it's a mixture is not known at this moment in time. But if this is an area that you're interested in, then please bear that uh, workshop in mind as well. And it's not just dominated by accelerators, it's all scientific facilities. And shown on this page are some of the subjects that have been discussed in the past. And it's a fairly live agenda, so some of these may well drop off and new areas come on. So uh, just bear it in mind. And with that, any questions? Hey, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, we have one question so far. Can any of the lessons learned on optimising energy efficiency of one act be relevant to, say, the ESTAR project we assembled in France, or even some of the small modular reactors in, in the UK, actually? Um, yes. Um, I think the simple answer is yes. I mean, they're obviously different technologies, but it's what I'm talking about are the design processes. So if you know your input parameters, then um, it's the process that you can apply to controlling and managing those parameters. Okay. Um. So, um, last one question as well. Um, so, um, what's the sort of, uh, is there any plans to do some of this stuff at ISIS 1 as opposed to waiting for the upgrade? Uh, yes, I mean, um, I, sorry, apologies for not making that clear. So, all these processes we're looking to introduce on ISIS 1. And there's two reasons for that. One is that hopefully it makes us more efficient and it gives us the opportunity to trial them and see what works and what doesn't work. I mean, ISIS 2 at this moment in time is scheduled on paper only to come online in, say, 2040. So that's uh, just yeah. over 20 years away, basically. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's very interesting. I think it's good to see that we're at least starting to think of the next accelerator as well, the energy efficiency and I hope that the UK Expel as well starts to think about this as well. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Uh, what will uh, perhaps be our last speaker, unless uh, uh, Razor appears, is um, Wendell Bailey. Who's from Southampton? He's stepped in on us for that for Yai Ping Yang, who was originally speaking, also from the University of Southampton. Uh, and there we talk about coal powering um, and the LHC using uh, superconducting cables for transporting power. Uh, Wendell, are you. Hello. Can you see my screen okay? No, not yet. Okay, that's a bit strange. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, see yeah, now. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for providing the team at Southampton with this uh, platform to talk about uh, energy saving and coal powering of accelerator magnets, and particularly coming from an LHC perspective. <laughs> So just a very quick overview of what I'd like to discuss during the talk. Coal powering is, is in essence the delivery of uh, electrical current to the superconducting hardware, in particular the magnets, and how this affects accelerators. Um, 
will go on how, how we go about utilising HTS current needs to help reduce the refrigeration costs by, uh, by a factor of 10. And then how all this kind of uh, accumulates into the, the new high luminosity project or the upgrades at CERN where they require some uh, remote powering scenarios to circumnavigate the higher radiations that are going to exist within a tunnel uh, and in, in particular the relocation of uh, a number of power converters and then finally i'll just touch on the kind of a bit more detail about uh, a particular achievement or a challenge and achievement about the uh, magnesium bi diboride uh, sc link cable which is a, a gas cool cable uh, and how that then integrates within the, the kind of global uh, configuration, new configuration at the LHC. So a little bit of a, a, a track record and a, collab a collaboration history with, uh, with CERN, uh, University of Southampton has been a, a long standing R&D partner. Uh, we first uh, got involved with the 13 kiloamp prototype currently cable current needs for the uh, LHC string. Uh, later, we then partnered with Pirelli uh, to win the only commercial contract at the time, which was available under the coal powering schemes for delivery of 42 off uh, 7,500 ampere cables. We then developed uh, a number of cryogenic test beds, one being for testing the series of 200 off 600 amp current leads. And then since the inception of the high luminosity project, we've been kind of a, a contributor from right from the start. So we've uh, developed a number of test beds to explore HTS options for potential the link, potential link cable. We developed uh, conceptual designs for the cryostats that are now located in the newly excavated uh, galleries to house the current needs and providing kind of input to a number of deployment solutions for, for the SE link as it uh, has to navigate from the cavern down to the shaft into the tunnel. But I'll, I'll come on to those in a little bit. So this slide shows a, a nice cross section of the, the LHC ring. And we followed this by giving a, a feeling probably of the volume of magnets that are already exist in the LHC today, uh, whether they be the quadrupoles, uh, the correct magnets, uh, the dipoles, but this, the, the volumes there are, are significant. And this image here just shows uh, a nice uh, view of what is existing today. So here we show examples of uh, other key components uh, of the powering circuit. Uh, these being the power converters used in the, in the current scheme. These are not semiconducting, uh, they are in actual fact uh, water cooled. Uh, but probably the main message here is the amount of current that is required to drive this multitude of magnets is uh, quite significant. Some of starting with the 13,000 amperes for all the dipoles. Uh, 6,000 amperes for the quadrupoles and an array between 600 to 60 amps for the correct magnet. I like this image here just to show that uh, hopefully we're not using uh, these uh, chunky cables, but we can do something better maybe. So the energy required for the LHC ring is too high to deliver from uh, a single circuit. So the, the ring circuit is actually subdivided into eight sections. Uh, and we require here a good gauge, the sizing of these kind of uh, dump resistors required to protect the system during the event of uh, a quench occurring at the, the superconducting hardware. So the current leads are located right at the key interface between the power converter and this uh, interconnection box here, and uh, just in front of this magnet cryostat. Uh, we must therefore kind of aim to optimize and reduce the heat loads entering this uh, cold environment, this cold envelope. So um, 
loan resistant materials such as copper would reduce the over losses uh, and their contribution. However, we are penalised if we want to, to take, make use of uh, low risk sensitivity, which tends to come with high thermal conductivity. So we, we clearly understand the competition between small cross section and long lengths to minimise heating, but we therefore increase the resistance for the current delivery. And then if we design to utilise uh, the self cooling via boil off, uh, we generate during normal operating conditions, but we can further reduce the total heat load. Just, uh, just to highlight that the, this optimal case with the, between these two uh, extremities. So do we really win if we explore different conductor choices? Uh, since the main mechanism at play here is the rate in is that play is in the rate this regime is the the electron scattering at the lattice level, uh, we are we are governed by the the Friedman Franz rule, and uh, and actually what we see here are for two particular cases for uh, vapor cooled stainless steel and uh, for copper, we see that the the Q min is more or less optimized around this uh, this one watt per kilogram level. So the overall message in this slide is the is the current ratings to drive the magnets is, is significant. And the table gives a good breakdown of the distribution between the, the specific magnet types and the quantities of leads required to service them. So here we can see the total current is around three megaampers, a uh, heat load of around 3.5 kilowatts at a 4.2 operating condition if we were to use optimal leads design. In actual fact, this uh, heat load it makes up a small fraction, only 2% of the cooling power at, is at four, at 4 Kelvin and CERN's existing 18 kilowatt cooler delivers 230 watts per, per one watt at 4 Kelvin, which is effectively a third of the Carno efficiency, but at a quite a heavy cost, uh, budget at the cost of around 200 pounds per year, about 200,000 pounds per year. So this image here shows the elements broken down for uh, for an HTS currently. We have the HTS part and the resistive part. Using uh, using the HTS, we can uh, have a smaller cross section, and we can make the cross section is significantly smaller. So we can also use uh, make use of. Uh, Low thermal, low thermal conductions with use of silver or gold alloys. And the resistive part of the current lead can make use of the waste heat or waste cooling at 20 Kelvin, particularly from the beam screens. You can see in this image here how the, the architecture of the resistive part has been transformed into a, a kind of an optimized heat exchanger. So the graph here shows the, the mass for flow rate available for cooling scale per unit kilo, kilo amps plotted against the HTS operating temperature. Uh, and can be used as a tool to select the, the kind of particular performance criteria for operating the, the HTS currently. Now from this graphic, we can, we can see here that the LFC currently is, uh, are distributed with this type of uh, about 0 0.045 mass flow rate and operating at 50 Kelvin. I too have selected a slightly higher operating temperature, around 65. But in essence, from this graphic, we see only we see clearly the step change in the resistive heat loads offered by the the HTS currently in a in a vapor cool configuration dropping from here down to, to this kind of baseline, a factor of 10.
So this image just shows some of the, uh, the extensive R&D work that has uh, gone into the design of particular uh, current leads. It just shows a, a good cross section of, uh, of one of the types that we've been working on. Uh, we see here the implementation of the bank of current needs positioned in front of the, the magnet here inside the LHC. We can see these boxes here will be where the interconnections will be performed right in from the current needs down to the, to the magnets. What we shouldn't forget is the, the kind of the resistive leads. Uh, we, you're not, not just concentrating on the optimization of the HTTPS parts, but also the, providing some platforms and test beds for, for studying the resistive leads. Uh, what we see in this image is a, a cryostat built at the university to around a 750 diameter cryostat to enable us to look at this 60 ampere prototype uh, currently designed for the correct semiconductor. So a key accelerated performance metric is uh, luminosity, which is proportional to the number of collisions that occur in a, a given amount of time. So this is one of the, the major aims of the, the new high, lum high luminosity upgrades and the respective coal pairings. So one of the, the main things is we want to increase uh, the number of magnets. Uh, we require upgrades to many hundreds of magnets. Stronger and wider high radiation fields will expose a number of the electrical components to, to significant radiation, which may force them to be re relocated. Normal electric semiconductors between the current leads and the magnets is required, uh, which itself then kind of leads into more complex topologies for how we integrate the helium cooling both hydraulically and thermodynamically. And then replacing the low, therm low temperature superinducts of buzz bars and upgrading them with, uh, with HTS cables, which were at the time were, were not available. So this image shows a, a nice view of the LHC ring. And part of the University of Southampton delivery is for uh, delivery of uh, eight distribution feed boxes, uh, including two spare and two spares on top of that. These boxes will be located in uh, interaction points one and five, which are adjacent to Atlas and CMS as shown in the diagram. And we've got two types of uh, circuits we're dealing with. The first circuit being DFHS, a superconducting link then leading to uh, a, a distribution feed box called DFX. And similarly, on the other side, another box with DFHN to SC link to another distribution feed box on the matching side. So this image probably shows the circuit a little bit clearer. So what we're aiming to do is these power converters, which were previously located in the in the main LXC tunnel. We're now relocated them into this service tunnel or gallery, service gallery. Obviously the yellow boxes there show the the, the, the box which contains the current leads and then we have this uh, orange strand and purple strand coming from this side which represent the, the link cable which travels through this cavern and then down the transit shaft down into the main uh, LHC tunnel, obviously adjoining so the interconnections are carried out in this DFX box on the mat on the on the matching side, sorry, on the crossing side, and DFM on the matching side here. So there's an additional heat load to, to be absorbed in taking up this 150 meter SC link cable. It itself contains a, a multiple of bends and so you see these undulations in here uh, can, can be used to compensate for the contraction of the cable with respect to its, uh, its own cryostat. 
and the boil off itself needs to be generated and vented along this uh, long SC link cryo stack. So the boil off generated either in this box here or this box here. So this is kind of the, the baseline scheme. This is like a, a 2D flattened view of the of the, the new parent scheme for high Lumi LHC. LHC. So you can see here that we've got the, the two circuits here. This is the shaft here, which is around eight meters in, in length. Uh, DFX, this current scheme for, for DFX is that we have a a cry stack which is able to be located immediately under the shaft uh, and then joins to the D1 magnet circuit. And then for DFN, the proposition is that we can carry the link all the way through and then we feed it into this kind of hovering cry stack which lives just above the D1 magnet. The anticipation is that uh, the cable, the SC link developed for DFN is going to be smaller than for the DFX, which uh, probably gives us some license here to to uh, absorb uh, some of the to kind of locate the cross stat in this location uh, and bring this cable through all the way through into this uh, into the tunnel. Which well, wasn't the case with uh, the DFX, mainly due to these splices uh, and the need to be able to access these splices if if there were a problem. So the overall coal budget for DFX is 100 watts at 4 Kelvin uh, for the 120 kilo amperes, and DFM slightly lower, 40, 40 watts at 4 Kelvin for this kind of smaller cables. A further 50% reduction is possible if we can utilize the 20K gas to help cool down the current needs in the current cabins. So this slide just shows the cable architecture of the SCU link containing a total of 19 cables of various sizes bundled for the SCU link. The red circles represent the copper stabilizers. The major achievement during this kind of first, first benchmark test uh, two benchmark tests were conducted uh, on a prototype uh, 70 meter cable and uh, the diameter of this is, a, is around 90 millimeters now. Um, both of them were successful tests, Nominal, normally required operating currents were achieved at the 20 Kelvin operating temperature. This uh, set of images shows a kind of uh, the kind of the extent of the investment to enable to the, the manufacturing of the DSC link itself. You gave it a good sense of feeling about the, the kind of type of tooling and spooling that's required to um, place this, this cable. First, you unwind the cable, uh, and then what you see here going on is the insertion of the cable into its uh, its cry its cry stacked envelope, so it's it's inserted in the first cry stacked, and then there will be a, a second flexible cry stacked envelope, which is used to in the annulus is evacuated to correct the insulation. What we see here is a cross section of the the DFX, and uh, we can see here this uh, in particular the unconventional cryogenic the Christac design that's been type of particularly forced upon us, mainly to accommodate the, the, the restrictions in height available uh, within the space just under the shaft, as I was showing earlier. But also the need that uh, this box is going to be used to, to contain a number of spices or interconnections between different cables. So this yellow box here will be used for the spices that come from the cable, the, L, the, the, the niobium titanium cable coming from the magnets, which then joins now to, a, to another a smaller tail of niobium titanium cable and uh, the supposed to have performed in situ inside the tunnel. The plan is that the, the, 
the MGB2 SC link will be inserted with uh, the MGB2 to Niobium titanium splices already made at the surface, which gives them uh, a lot more confidence to ensure that the, those connections, those uh, splices are made uh, to the to spec uh, and they can be fully tested before insertion. The problem that leads to is that the, the splices need to be well protected uh, so the plan is for the, 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 the splices to be contained in a, in, a, in a kind of shell, protective shell, which will actually stay part of the cryostat design. Uh, the splices themselves need a, a, a reasonable space occupation. And this kind of small elbow here just about gives enough room to do a, a small transition uh, a bending transition from the vertical to the horizontal with the niobium cable. Uh, what we see here the, is just the, the finished uh, outer view of the, the DFX system. Similarly, we've got the, the kind of the, the conceptual design stage of the DFM. Uh, the DFM differs slightly. We've got this kind of uh, angled entry approach because we've got a lot more horizontal space within the tunnel uh, before the cryostat is located above the, the D2 magnet. And for that reason, and because the cable is a lot smaller in diameter, we've taken advantage of that in terms of the, we have a smaller section here. So we've tried to use the, the headroom that, we, that is available between this and the D1 to, to, to locate the cryostat, because um, obviously there are other items within that space. Um, and then in, in one of the, the small design differences between this and uh, DFX is that the, the boiling or the generation of the, the gas for cooling of the SU link is done in a, in a secondary tank uh, adjacent or just to the side of the, the FM cryostat. Uh, and obviously the gas will be generated and, and cooled. Uh, it will leave up through this, uh, where the, the direction of the SU link here. The lead liquid level will only fill up to this uh, level here. We don't want it to intrude and completely shut off the, the gas volume. With the size being a lot smaller, we anticipate that this will be a, a category two pressure vessel, which should uh, simplify the, the manufacturing process. Uh, the DFX is, is, uh, will be a, a category three pressure vessel. Uh, and this is just the final slide, just to show a, a bit more of a 3D schematic view of the of the where the DFX will live with respect to D2 and the QXL, which is the, the cryogenics hub or main services for the liquid that will you be used to fill uh, and the vent services that will go back to the to the cryogenic plant. So in conclusion, the HTS current needs uh, for the NCS has been a, a, a big success not just for the machine, but just in general for superconductivity and cryogenics on a, on a wider basis. Um, a lot of investment has been funneled into a lot of innovation, which not just only brings fundamental changes, but uh, significant savings to the, the, coal, the coal powering schemes. A lot of experience has been gathered uh, during the, the LHC current, the LHC current needs designs which hopefully then could be led into the, the kind of the future applications of superconductors, particularly in the energy sector. And then finally, there's a, a whole raft of new opportunities ahead for us, both in terms of innovation and business. And thank you for, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Wendell. Again, uh, anyone in the audience wants to ask any questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom. One thing I was going to ask Wendell, so after LHC, when we go on to the next machine, whether it be FCC or the, the Chinese Collider, um, will you, would you still use the magnesium diboride or do you think there's a chance that there may be higher temperatures of conductors um, able to use as currently by them? Well, I, I see that I don't see NGB2 disappearing off the map. I think there is definitely scope there for a, a, the, the NGB story for is just started. So 
I would hope that it will be a, a very strong consideration for kind of moving forwards. Um, whether there is, uh, whether our other HTS materials uh, become potential solutions, I, I suppose depends on the, the kind of the, the global cooling power circuit that needs to be uh, configured there. Okay. Um, if you don't have any other questions, then uh, we'll finish there. Thank you very much for your talk. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the talk today. It was uh, very interesting. A very wide variety of ways of saving energy have been uh, covered today. Um, so I want to thank all the speakers for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, you can follow up those speakers individually, or if you um, need contact details, you can contact yourself or Joanne. And um, sounds like there's a, a, a very interesting European workshop on summer veins, probably not just for accelerators, and, and maybe the UK wants to think about hosting it one year. We seem to have a, a lot of activity in that sector, so uh, that might be something we, we could consider in the future. So thanks everyone for joining us, and um, I hope to see you at a future of these um, Half-Blood Cellular Engineering Network meetings. Thank you very much. Thanks.